Thank you, man. Thirty seconds to broadcast. It's a family tradition. Mayor and Council, we are live. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, good evening, everyone. I want to well call this meeting of Durham City Council to order at 7 p.m. on Monday, October the 5th, and certainly want to welcome everyone here tonight, all the uh, our, our city staff, my colleagues, and all the people who are attending this meeting in one way or another. Uh, we're certainly glad to have you tonight. Um, before we start our uh, moment of silent meditation, I want to uh, keep in mind all those who are uh, continue to be suffering from the coronavirus, and that includes our president and first lady. I hope we will keep all of them in mind uh, as we as, as we. Uh, engage in our silent meditation. Please join me for a moment of silent meditation. Thank you. Councilmember Reese, will you please lead us in a pledge to the flag? I will. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, colleagues. Um, I will now uh, recite the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much, Council Member Reese. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Mayor Shul. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Here. Councilmember Caballero. Here. Councilmember Freelon. Here. Councilmember Freeman. Present. Councilmember Middleton. Here. Councilmember Reese. Here. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. And now we will move to ceremonial items. Uh, we have four items on our agenda tonight. And uh, the first item is Hispanic Heritage Month. And I'm going to call on Councilmember Caballero. Uh, before I do that, I wanna just say that uh, we, we've added back our ceremonial items, uh, our, our proclamations and so forth, uh, but we haven't yet uh, added back people being here to receive them. That's something we will be working on uh, in the future as we continue to add more and more things to our virtual meetings. Uh, but we haven't uh, quite solved that complication yet, uh, but we're glad to have those people here who are uh, listening to our meeting in order to hear these proclamations. Councilmember Caballero. Yes, Mr. Mayor, I would just like to make an interpretation announcement. We are, we do have Zoom interpretation for the evening. Um, and if you see at the bottom of your screen, there should be a little icon that looks like a globe you should select your language that you prefer. And now I'm gonna let our interpreter who should have been enabled make that same announcement. Yes, uh, Javier, I, I, I already did. Oh, thank you. <laughs> then it worked beautifully. Um, I'm not seeing an attachment for my procl the proclamation. You're muted, Mr. Mayor. It's in the I, I will send that to you. I have the latest one. That's fine. Sure, go ahead. You can use I, that. That'd be great. Yeah, I just need to.
And I just want to thank the mayor's Hispanic and Latino committee who wrote this year's proclamation. Um, so thank you to the members who were able to do that for us this year. Whereas National Hispanic Heritage Month is celebrated annually, annually from September 15th through October 15th to celebrate the histories, cultures, and contributions of American citizens with ancestry from Spain, Mexico, the Caribbean, and Central and South America. And whereas the 2020 National Hispanic Heritage Month theme is Hispanics, be proud of your past and embrace the future. And whereas the city of Durham embraces persons of Hispanic heritage and recognizes that this population has, has had and continues to have a profound and positive influence in Durham. And whereas the Hispanic community has faced significant hardships this year, in including the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 and the unwanted hysterectomies performed on immigrant women at the hands of ICE, and whereas the city of Durham recognizes the efforts led by community organizations to support the Hispanic community like La Semilla, Latinx 19, El Centro Hispano, El Futuro, Church World Service, and NC Youth Contra COVID. And whereas the city of Durham celebrates the election of the first Latina Alexandra Valladares to the Durham Board of Education in 2020, the appointment of Pablo Friedman as the first Latino department director at Durham Public Schools and the appointments of Sonia Marquez and Jose Cardosa as the first Latinx assistant principals at Durham Public Schools. And whereas the city is committed to seeking to improve existing opportunities and to open new doors for Hispanic and Latinx residents of all backgrounds, thereby fostering inclusive communities with equitable resources and opportunities. Now, therefore, I, Stephen Shule, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim September 15th through October 15th, 2020 as Hispanic Heritage Month in Durham and hereby urge all residents to honor the distinction, the distinct traditions of the Hispanic community and their contributions to our city, state and nation by participating in relevant ceremonies, activities and programs. Witness my hand this fifth day of October, 2020. I think we will, should do the appropriate clapping. Thank you, council member. I think we should add another milestone. I was thinking as you were reading your resolution uh, or your proclamation uh, that we have another milestone within city government, uh, which is the appointment of uh, Sarah Moreno Young to be our city planning, city county planning director um, within the last month. So let's add that wonderful milestone as well. Thank you so much, council member. Our second ceremonial item um, is Arts and Humanities Month. Uh, as you all know, we limit our ceremonial items to three, and you might notice that there are four ceremonial items on here tonight. Uh, so uh, I am, um, the, uh, I really have more of an announcement tonight about National Arts and Humanities Month. October is recognized nationally as Arts and Humanities Month, and the city of Durham has recognized this by proclamation for several years with the Durham Arts Council. At our next city council meeting on October 19th, we will officially present the full proclamation in celebration of the power of the arts. So we will look forward to that full proclamation um, next month. And now we will move to our third uh, ceremonial item, which is the, the Alpha, Alpha Kappa Alpha Breast Cancer Awareness Proclamation. And I'll be reading that. Whereas October is National Breast Cancer Awareness Month, the month dedicated to increasing public knowledge about the importance of early detection of breast cancer. And whereas National Mammography Awareness Day is observed annually on the third Friday in October, as part of the National Breast Cancer Awareness Month, established during the presidency of William J. Clinton in 1993. And whereas October 16, 2020 is the 27th anniversary of National Mammography Awareness Day, this day serves as a reminder to all women that mammograms are the best method of early detection of breast cancer. And whereas Alpha, Alpha Kappa Alpha Society Incorporated, under the leadership of International President Dr. Glenda Glover, is seeking to raise awareness about the effects of breast cancer through its 2018-2022 international program, exemplifying excellence through sustainable service. 
And whereas Alpha, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated encourages women ages 40 to 44 to begin annual screening mammography and seeks to help 100,000 women by sharing information concerning breast cancer to increase awareness regarding the risk factors that contribute to breast cancer. And whereas Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated launched the Alpha Kappa Alpha Mobile Mammography Unit on the campus of Texas Southern, Texas Southern University, providing access to mammograms to the uninsured. Now, therefore, I, Stephen M. Shule, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim October 16, 2020 as Mammography Awareness Day in Durham. And hereby encourage healthcare services, hospitals, clinics, and insurance companies to deliver affordable options so every woman of every income will have easy access to mammograms and be informed on their risk of breast cancer through continuous screening. Witness my hand and the corporate seal this the fifth day of the fifth day of October 2020. Um, yes, the clapping. Thank you. And uh, thank you to Alpha Kappa Alpha for this good work uh, and for submitting this resolution again this year. And our final resolution will be read by Council Member Freeman. This is the 75th, 75th anniversary of the Durham chapter of Jack and Jill of America. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I will add that I do have a phenomenal uh, member of Alpha Kappa Alpha's uh, quoted shirt on today and then noting that there's no vaccine for racism and uh, appreciation of Kamala Harris. I um, will read the proclamation for the Jack and Jill organization. Uh, whereas philanthropic, philanthropic volunteer civic organizations are responsible for enhancing the quality of life of people in their community. And whereas organizations that are formed with the desire to improve the lives of its members in the community address and, and to, to address and combat the ills that plague our nation. And whereas philanthrop philanthrop philanthropy is uniquely woven into the fabric of the African-American community. And whereas Jack and Jill of America Incorporated was founded January 24th, 1938 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, from a meeting of 20 mothers by the leadership of Marion Stubbs Thomas with the idea of bringing together children in a social and cultural environment. And whereas Jack and Jill is a membership organization of mothers with children ages two to 19, dedicated to nurturing future African-American leaders by strengthening children through leadership development, volunteer services, philanthropic giving and civic duty. And whereas the Durham chapter of the Jack and Jill was founded October the 9th, 1945 on the campus of North Carolina Central University by Ms. Leonia Dorsey, a founding member of, of the first Jack and Jill Club. And whereas the charter members were Geraldine Austin, Ms. William N. Bailey, Mabel Les Beal, Adrian Bulware, Beatrice Burnett, Mabel Bell Crooks, Leonia Dorsey, Maria Faggett, Mo Molly Lee, Alice McClendon, Virginia Morgan, Marianne Malassi, Miss Ernest Neal, Willie o Ogilby, Oglesby, Hattie Scarborough, Dessa Turner, Lincible Taylor, and Lily Taylor, Catherine Walker, Virginia Wheels, and Ann Wright. And whereas the Durham chapter has served the surrounding counties for 75 years by actively pan planning various programs <laughs> have partnered with local and national organizations such as the Children's Defense Funds, the March of Dimes, UNICEF, When We All Vote, Boys and Girls Club of Durham in Orange Counties, Agape Corner, Table, Genesis House, Grace Outreach Ministry, Enrichment Ministry, Durham, Durham Rescues Mission, and Whereas for 75 years, the chapter has dedicated its resources to improving the quality of life, particularly for African-American children. Today, the Durham chapter is comprised of 75, 73 families and remains equally dedicated to seeking for all children the same advantages we desire for our own. Now, therefore, I, Steve, Steve, Steve Shule, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim that October 9th, 2020 be a reminder of the Durham chapter 
of the Jack and Jill Mothers members committed commitment to address inequities that plague our community and their effort to develop African-American leaders. And I encourage residents to recognize the positive impact that service, leadership, and giving has on our community. Witness my right hand on the fifth day of October, 2020. Thank you very much, council member. And thank you to the members of Jack and Jill for their work. I must be very old because I knew two of those founding members. All right. Um, we will now move to announcements by members of the council. And I'm gonna call first on council member Reese because I know he has a couple of announcements. Council member Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, colleagues, uh, staff, and folks watching at home. Uh, two weeks ago, um, I uh, opened our meeting with an announcement about the fact that uh, Durham had not been responding as robustly to the US Census as many of us had hoped, um, and encouraging people to uh, fill out their census before the deadline of September 30th. Well, guess what? Uh, there's a new deadline in town, uh, October 31st, Halloween. Um, thanks to the intervention of a federal judge, um, the, the count it will go on through the end of the current month, October 31st. Um, uh, the, and so we've got still got time uh, to do outreach, to talk to our friends, neighbors, and families about how important it is for us to, to complete the census. So um, the easiest way to do that is to go to my2020census.gov. You can complete it online. Um, if you want to do it over the phone, that's great too. Uh, you can call 844-330-2020. Um, and if you want to fill it out over the phone in Spanish, you can dial 844-468-2020. It's really important that Durham get a complete and accurate count so that we re receive our fair share of federal funds for programs and services over the next 10 years. You know for sure the feds are going to collect all the taxes that we owe them. We certainly want to get all of the programs and services that we're entitled to. Uh, and that only happens if we have a complete and accurate count. So um, just please make sure you talk to the folks in your life about whether or not they filled out the census. Uh, there's lots of ways to do that. Second, Mr. Mayor, um, I, it's my hope that this item will not be pulled in tonight's, on tonight's agenda. And so I wanted to take uh, just a minute on item number 18, uh, which has to do with the conveyance of property located at 505 West Chapel Hill Street. Um, this has been a labor of love for a while here in our community, and I wanted to thank all of the staff members uh, with the City of Durham who made this agreement possible, uh, who achieved everything that we and our community has asked for them to bring us for this piece of property. Uh, that has been achieved, um, and I just also want to thank um, not only my colleagues on the Council who have been steadfast in their support of this project, but also, perhaps most importantly, community leaders in this city who refused to let anything else happen uh, other than what we promised them would happen with this property. The agreement that's on our agenda tonight fulfills that promise. Look forward to joining all of you um, at a legit ribbon cutting um, when, uh, when that blessed day arrives uh, and, and we're ready to open it up uh, once it's built. So thank you to staff, uh, my colleagues, and especially the people of Durham who refused uh, to accept the fact that there was nothing that could be done uh, to build this kind of community where lots of different folks of lots of different incomes live. My last announcement, Mr. Mayor, um, is a little bit more about current events than I usually like to say, but let me just say this. The coronavirus is still rampant in the world. It is not over. Um, and while we have had some good luck in Durham keeping our numbers low, or at least growing at a lower rate than the rest of the state, um, there are disturbing signs across the country uh, that the coronavirus uh, infections are on the rise again. I, normally, I wouldn't mention this, except today, the most, um, the most well-known coronavirus patient in the world um, checked himself out of the hospital and um, made some statements that it's not that big of a deal. You can't let it dominate your life. Um, he felt better than he's felt in 20 years. I just want to make sure that folks that can hear me understand that Getting COVID-19 will not make you feel 20 years younger. Um, chances are uh, most folks who, uh, who contract the coronavirus uh, are not going to have access to um, a suite of rooms at a top-notch medical facility uh, run by the government free of charge. They're not going to have access to experimental cutting-edge therapies that are not uh, approved for use 
uh, yet. Um, and they're, uh, they're not going to be able uh, to access that kind of recovery if, assuming um, the most famous patient in the world does recover. Um, so I just felt a moral obligation to make sure folks understood this is not over. Um, it's, there are still some troubling signs um, around the country that, that this could get worse again before it gets better. And I don't want anybody to think that seeing pictures um, of someone who is trying to project a, a sense of strength and well-being give anybody the impression that this isn't an extremely deadly and contagious illness. So please continue to do all the things that we know how to do to keep each other safe, wash your hands, wear a mask, and maintain social distancing. Those are the things we have to do to keep each other safe during this time. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm done with my announcements. Thank you very much, Council Member. All right, um, other announcements by members of the Council? All right, thank you. Seeing none, I'm going to now move to priority items by the city manager. I'm sorry, Council Member Freeman, do you have an announcement? Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, I had thought that uh, Council Member Reese would have covered it. Uh, just a note, early voting will begin October 15th and run through October 31st. Uh, I know that that will occur, that will start before our next council meeting. I wanted to make sure folks are aware and start to make a plan if they haven't already. Uh, just know that the early voting sites will be located throughout the county and I'm sure that more information will be available at the county's uh, Board of Elections website. Thank you. Thank you, council member. There are over six, I think it's over eight, 16 sites. So this would be a very spread out cycle for you to go vote where no one is, is, is really there. So no lines, go early. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Um, I don't believe there are any other announcements. And so I'm gonna move to priority items by the city manager, Madam Manager, welcome. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of the Durham City Council. I do have some priority items but if I may, I would like to make a, just a very uh, brief comment to the council. Uh, I appreciate your confidence in me uh, this evening uh, to lead the city of Durham as interim city manager after Tom Bonfield's retirement from a very long and historic career as a local government leader. For me, this is amaz an amazing opportunity, regardless of the length of time to arise every morning and serve alongside the more than 2,500 city employees, bringing dedication, creativity, and passion to local government service that I believe is unmatched. As a team filled with great leaders and contributors, we will, without a doubt, continue to move in excellence towards the important goals and priorities we have set together with you, our elected leaders, and our beloved community. I know we have some challenges ahead of us, uh, as an organization, as well as a community. And some of these challenges are great, but our vision, our courage, and our purpose is greater. I look forward to working collaboratively with you, our residents, community partners, and city staff, executing your policy, your policy direction with, spirit, with a spirit of transparency, inclusion, and accountability. So thank you uh, very much. And I do have some priority items uh, this evening. Uh, agenda item number six, uh, that would be fiscal year 21 participatory budgeting process. We have added an attachment to that item, attachment number two. Uh, agenda item number seven, contract with Moss and Ross LLC for communications consulting services. Uh, we have added an addition, some additional information has been provided in attachment number five. Agenda item number nine, supplemental agreement with WSP USA Inc. for Go Durham Planning and Operations. Uh, attachments one and three were updated. Agenda item number 12, nutrient analyzer service agreement with the HACH company. And we have also added some additional information uh, to this item and it is in attachment five. Agenda item number 18, proposed conveyance of property located at 505 West Chapel Hill Street uh, to, to West Chapel Hill Development LLC 
parcel ID 114577, attachment nine has been added. Uh, agenda item number 22, contract amendment number one for ST 264 Fayetteville Road improvements with Carolina Sunrock. Again, pursuant to council's request, we have added additional information uh, to this item and it is provided in attachment number five. Uh, agenda item number 24, update on cities addressing, addressing fines and fees equitably, uh, pr that project work. Pursuant to council's request, we have added some additional information and that item can be found in the section labeled priority items by the city manager, city attorney, and city clerk in the section of the 10-5-20 city council meeting agenda. Agenda item number 27, franchise with Duke Energy Carolinas LLC. Additional information has been provided in attachment number 10 and attachment number three was updated. And finally, agenda item Number 29, Consolidated Annexation National Heritage Academies, NHA Oak Grove Charter. Uh, and attachment number one was updated and attachment 16 was deleted. That is all I have. Thank you very much, Madam Manager, for those priority items. Madam Attorney, are there any priority items this evening? Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, members of the City Council. The City Attorney's Office has no priority items tonight. Thank you, Madam Attorney. Thank you. Madam Clerk, are there any priority items from the Clerk's Office tonight? Good evening, everyone. The City Clerk's Office has no priority items. Thank you, Madam Clerk. We will now move to the consent agenda. The consent agenda uh, is, consists of items that the Council has uh, previously worked on and can be approved by a single vote of the council. Council members or members of the public can pull items from the consent agenda. And if an item is pulled, it will be considered at the end of the meeting. Item one, Human Relations Commission appointment. Item two, Mayor's Council for Women appointment. Item three, Fuel Usage Performance Audit, June 2020. Item four, Water Billing Performance Audit, June 2020. Item five, amend the FY 2020-20 21 budget internal service fund spending plan and other grant amendments. Item six, FY21 participatory budgeting PB process. Item seven, contract with Moss and Ross LLC for communications consulting services. Item eight, move Durham transportation study. Item nine, supplemental agreement with WSP USA Inc for go Durham planning and operations analysis. Item 10, amendment one of the interlocal agreement with Chatham County respecting water savings. Item 11, high pressure zone improvement phase one, contract for professional engineering services. Item 12, nutrient analyzer service agreement with HACH company. Item 13, bid report, August 2020. August 14, construction contract with Bar Construction Company, Inc. at Valley Springs Park. Item 15, construction contract with Geosources Southeast, Inc. for the CM Herndon Park field conversion project. Item 16, construction services with engineered construction company for the Weaver Street and W.D. Hill Recreation Center renovations project. Item 17, celebrate Durham celebration of Black Artistry Public Art Project proposal and kudos to Councilmember Freeman. Item 18, proposed conveyance of property located at 505 West Chapel Hill Street to West Chapel Hill Development LLC, parcel ID 114-577. Item uh, 19, proposed lease agreement with Yarborough Warehousing and Storage LLC for the police department's property and evidence storage facility in the upfit of additional space. Item 20, City of Durham Employment and Training 2020-2022 Grant Project Ordinance. Item 21, contract SW77C for sidewalk asset management plan and condition study 2020 with Precision Safe Sidewalks LLC. Item 22, contract amendment number one for ST264 Fayetteville Road improvements with Carolina Sunrock LLC. Item 23, contract amendment number nine for ST264C for professional services related to Fayetteville Road improvement. You have heard the consent agenda and I'll now accept a motion for its approval. So moved. Okay. Moved by council member Reese, seconded by council member Freeman that we approve the consent agenda. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Mayor Shule. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Caballero. Aye. Councilmember Freelon. Aye. 
Councilmember Freeman. Aye. Councilmember Middleton. I vote aye. Councilmember Reese. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, the ayes have it. The motion passes unanimously and the consent agenda is approved. We will now move to our general business agenda, public hearings, and we will begin with item 27, the franchise with Duke Energy Carolinas LLC. And I see uh, Deputy City Manager Bo Ferguson is here with us. Good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, members of council. My name is Bo Ferguson. I'm the Deputy City Manager for Operations. We are here this evening to continue the public hearing in review of the proposed Duke Energy Franchise Agreement and associated documents. During and since the last public hearing, staff received feedback from a number of sources and has worked with Duke Energy staff to incorporate this feedback to the greatest extent possible into the documents under consideration this evening. A memorandum in Council's packet outlines the changes that are proposed to these documents as amended from when they were last reviewed at a work session on September 24. City staff and representatives from Duke Energy are available to answer any questions from Council. That concludes my comments prior to resuming the public hearing. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you so much, Mr. Ferguson. Hey, colleagues, you have heard the report from staff and uh, this, this uh, hearing, as Mr. Ferguson said, uh, is a continuation of an earlier hearing. Uh, and so I don't need to uh, open the hearing, but I will just uh, remind you that the hearing, this public hearing is now open. Um, Madam Clerk, we have three people who have signed up to speak on this item. I will be recognizing them first. Uh, Alice Sharp, Ethan LaCicero, and Tom Campbell. And I believe that there may be people here. I, I know that there are people here uh, who also are interested in speaking on item 27 The um, that I have seen previously in the chat. Um, so I just want to let those people know, anyone is here as a attendee and is interested in speaking on this item, don't worry, you will be able to speak on this item. Um, I see Stephanie Foreman uh, is here to speak on this item. And I believe that may be all, but I just want to be clear that we will give everyone a chance to be heard. Um, and and uh, maybe I will, uh, I, will, I will start first though by asking at this point, are there any questions by members of the council for our staff at this point? Council Member Freeman. I just had one. I noticed um, that I know in the previous meeting we had quite a few conversations about a few complaints. And I just wanted to know, because I noticed noticed a few folks complimenting the lights. Were there any uh, well-received information? Like I, I hadn't heard on the other side of this conversation and if there were folks who were um, really appreciative of these, uh, the lights that were put in place. And I, and I wasn't sure if that was connected to this, but I wanted to make sure that I did make a point of noting that. Um, uh, so Mayor, I, I believe Bill Judge is in the meeting and uh, Bill would probably be the appropriate staff person to address that. I'll ask uh, Bill to unmute and uh, provide that, that feedback. Thank you, and I do want to just, uh, in partial answer to your question, one of your questions, Councilmember Freeman. Um, yes, this is an appropriate time to talk about that. Um, and uh, also, uh, colleagues, you will know, you will, uh, you may have noted that we got five or six written comments uh, sent to us through the clerk about the lights as well. Mr. Judge. Yes, thank you, Bill Judge, Transportation. Uh, we have gotten uh, some comments uh, in support of the lights and saying that they like them. We've even had a few folks ask for additional lights. Um, certainly not as many probably as the most recent round of complaints with most projects or things. Uh, you tend to hear more from the, the folks that dislike it than that, that do, but there are definitely folks that, that support it and like the lights in the current configuration. Thank you, Mr. Judge. Yes, thank you. And I only wanted to note, because I had heard from a few folks around um, some areas where the lighting was only on one side of the street, that it was helpful that it was able to cover both sides as opposed to just the one side. And so I just wanted to make sure that that aspect was included in the conversation. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Judge, I'll have some comment uh, questions later about that as well, but um, unless there are other questions for staff now, I will move on to public comment. All right. Um, I will now uh, move on to public comment. Uh, and uh, we have, so, as far as I know, four people who would like to comment, and we will begin with Alice Sharp. Um, Madam Clerk, can you make Ms. Sharp available? I see that Ms. Sharp is available to comment. Ms. Sharp, welcome. We're glad to have you. And uh, you have three minutes. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, my name is Alice Sharp. I live at 208 Rigsby Avenue uh, in Durham. And I'm a Durham native. And I'm here to speak on behalf of Durham Energy. I am in support of continuing the city continuing the collaboration with Duke Energy. And just want to remind people what a good community partner Duke Energy has been and is today. Um, I don't agree with everything they do, but I can tell you they work to make our communities better. From the seniors at the Senior Center, um, Durham County Library has been, for whom I worked, has been well supported by Duke Energy and Duke Energy has a continuing and supportive interest in broadening our connections in the community. And that includes the Latinx community that you spoke of earlier. And I also want to say how Duke Energy has been a good partner for Durham Crop Walk. And I do want to say that for those of you who don't know, we lost Karen Johansson today. Karen had coordinated Crop Walk for Durham for many years, she was our leader, and I just want to give a nod to her. But all in all, I do hope that you will support Duke Energy and also recognize that there have been moves to consolidate Duke Energy with a larger company that would make it one of the largest utility companies in the nation. We don't, Duke Energy does not support that, nor do we. So I hope we certainly consider our Durham, the city of Durham's position in terms of uh, partnering being with Duke Energy as opposed to being under one big umbrella. Thank you. Ms. Sharp, thank you so much. We, I'm sorry that we are not able to be with you in person. It's great to have you here with us. And I'm so sad to hear about Karen Johansson. Thank you so much for letting us know that. Karen was just an amazing civic contributor and a wonderful person. And I'm sorry to hear that news, but I appreciate you bringing it to us. All right. Um, we will now hear from Ethan Lo Cicero. Uh, Mr. Lo Cicero, welcome. We're glad to have you with us. And you also have three minutes. Hi there, it's good to be here. Um, thanks for letting me speak. Um, so I first want to acknowledge that there has been a good bit of progress on the um, memorandum since the last draft, um, but there's still a few points that I think are worth um, holding out on and trying to get some stronger language in there. Um, one of my primary concerns is um, that a lot of the stipulations in this have to do with collaborating between Durham and Duke Energy where we um, have common interests and I think that's great, except that um, the wording seems to kind of go out of its way in this document to allow Duke Energy to not acknowledge climate change and environmental injustices um, and the need for um, a transition to renewable energy and a reduction in fossil fuels. Um, so the whole collaboration doesn't really mean very much um, in terms of action on climate change, unless they acknowledge that and the need for um, more action on that. Um, I also think we could hold out um, to have stronger wording around um, commitment to solar energy. Right now it's limited to city operations and I think it's part of the city's goal to um, extend that to um, the broader community. Um, 
And so ultimately, I think the main question is, does this agreement give the city the power and the freedom to achieve our energy goals over the next 10 years? And does it give us the flexibility as technology evolves? And I don't think it's quite there yet. Um, that's all I have for you. Thank you for those comments, Mr. LaCicera. We're glad to have you with us. Uh, the third speaker is uh, Tom Campbell. Uh, Mr. Campbell, are you able to be heard? Uh, I hope so, Mr. Mayor. Thank uh, you. And again, it's always good to have a former council member back with us. Uh, well, I'll, 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 I'll try not to uh, to haunt you too often uh, in, the, in the future. Um, and I, I, I would like to echo many of the things Ethan said, but I would also like to point out that there are certainly improved possibilities uh, in these documents, especially in the Memorandum of Understanding. Uh, the proof will be in uh, how well, um, how well uh, Duke Energy and the city perform on these goals. Um, the, the, the Memorandum of Understanding says that Duke will work with the city to plan and implement community solar projects and a pilot project to for improving energy and efficiency in our buildings, which I think would be especially helpful focused on uh, low income neighborhoods. Um, that they will work on a pilot project to improve um, resilience uh, through things like microgrids, distributed generation with battery storage. Um, and undergrounding of utility lines. Um, and uh, on your own, the city, when these documents are signed, the city will be able to produce, store, and discharge electricity itself. Um, and Duke Energy <coughs> agrees to purchase um, city-generated power if the city uh, so desires. Um, and uh, it also says that my reading is that the city may purchase um, renewable electricity uh, from, from other generators. Uh, and, uh, uh, I, I think that uh, these are all positive steps and uh, you know, the city wouldn't have to build a uh, renewable energy system all its own. It could uh, lease systems from uh, lease purchase systems from large solar producers of which a number of them are headquartered right here in the city of Durham. So there are possibilities here, uh, but they're gonna have to be followed, followed up on, followed through, and, and I, I hope that that happens. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Campbell. We're glad to have you with us. Um, I know now that we have another speaker uh, who is Stephanie Foreman. Uh, Ms. Foreman, are you able to be heard? I think so. Can you hear me? Yes. Welcome. We're glad to have you and you have three minutes. Great. Um, good evening, council members. I'd like to speak about the new LED streetlights, specifically the following three issues. First, the health consequences associated with 4,000 Kelvin LED lights and Blue Ridge lighting. Second, the illumination levels and resulting light trespass into people's homes. And third, the recourse individual residents currently have and some citywide options and solutions to address these problems. I know the city council has received many emails about this, so I'll be brief on, on my first two points. Four years ago, the American Medical Association released a report about the negative health effects of 4,000 Kelvin LED lights and light on the blue end of the visible spectrum. The Council of Science and Public Health found that the pervasive use of nighttime lighting disrupts various biological processes creating potentially harmful health effects related to disability glare and sleep disturbance. I can only speak for myself, but for almost five weeks, I've had city street lights shining into my bedroom, disrupting my sleep and preventing the use and enjoyment of my porch. But this is not an individual problem. This is a city problem. Earlier today, city council received a map of survey responses collected by the Old West Durham board. Of 148 collected responses from across the city, only four responses were positive and felt the lights were an improvement. The other 144 responses felt the lights were too bright, invasive and disruptive. And I know that the council is able to see many of the other 
responses. So on to some possible solutions. I fully believe the city can find an appropriate balance that addresses the concerns its residents have while still adequately lighting our streets. I'm encouraged by the statement that alternative lighting is available as described on the Transportation Department's FAQ page. And some alternatives I'd like to raise are replacing existing lights with ones that are 3000 Kelvin or less, installing light shields or baffles on all street lights, not on individual requests, dimming the lights during off peak hours or after a certain time, like after midnight to minimize disruption to sleep cycles and wildlife, and then evaluating and reducing the density of streetlights throughout the city. I can say on my short block of Lawndale, we have five of these LED lights. And to me, that feels too many and too bright. And I think that there are a lot of, like I said, reasonable solutions to address concerns, but still light Durham streets. Thank you for taking the time to listen. And I look forward to what the city council um, comes to on this issue. Thank you, Ms. Foreman. We really appreciate that. We did receive the uh, map from the uh, members of uh, Old North Durham. I'm sorry, of, of Old West Durham. And um, I appreciate the work that went into that and uh, also your comments. Let me ask now, is there anyone else that would like to be heard on this item who's an attendee tonight? If so, could you please uh, raise your digital hand or put your information in the chat. I don't believe there is anyone else, but I just want to make sure. Madam Clerk, I don't see anyone else. Do you? No, sir. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, we have heard from members of the public. And now uh, I will ask if there are any questions at this point by members of the council for our staff. All right, I have some questions. Um, uh, I will um, begin by uh, seconding one of the things that uh, Mr. Tom Campbell said in his remarks, which is that this, these agreements, especially the memorandum of understanding, these agreements are only as good as our implement our joint implementation. And so I'm interested in hearing um, from staff uh, on their, uh, yeah, and let, let me just say a little bit more. The, the, we are now in the midst of, or uh, in the process of creating a work plan, or, or rather the, uh, the city's own energy action plan, which will be done sometime in 2021, FY 2021. And, and then the MOU says that the work plan will develop after this energy action plan. Um, and so one of my question is, that could be a while before a full work plan is developed. I think those are the kinds of things that take some time to do well. But we also know that there's some things that we need to take, go ahead and begin to take advantage of now. So one of my questions is, and we heard a little bit about this last uh, two weeks ago when, with the discussion of the RFI for the Green Source Advantage. Um, but what are some of the things that we ought to be doing and can be doing in the next year and something uh, while the energy action plan, the city's energy action plan and the joint work plan between Duke and the city are being developed. What are the, what are some things that we can move forward now and in, 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 uh, begin to implement? Sure, Mayor, I'd like to ask Stacy Poston uh, from General Services, who's really been the point person on developing the MOU to talk a little bit about uh, the, the content there of, of that program, but also our ongoing relationship with Duke as it pertains to those matters. Stacy. Good evening, Mayor, members of Council. Stacy Post in the General Services Department. Happy to be here this evening. So we have a number of initiatives that have been going on. So we have been really working on dual tracks. One is understanding that we need to have a comprehensive master plan for our entire portfolio and engaging GDS associates to help us 
look at all the data that we have, analyze the data we have, and, and put that in some sort of semblance of order of what things ought to come first sequentially and um, how much those things are going to cost. Separate from that, we have been doing a number of things, um, some of which council is aware of and some of which you all may not be. So we had passed a number of years ago, I think in 2018, the sustainability roadmap, which really was kind of the first pass at trying to gather all the different things that all the departments were doing in just you know, seven chapters and identifying those and moving them towards actionable items that we were measuring progress on across multiple departments. Um, next, we have been installing solar. So we have solar at uh, Fire Station 17. We are just about to install uh, in February solar on the new sign and signal shop. We have solar coming in the queue on Fire Station 18 and General Services Building next. Additionally, we have been doing LED lighting replacement at a number of our facilities. I believe we've done it at 15 facilities right at this point, and we are continuing to move into now buildings that we are leasing. So we have police substations where we have long-term leases, and we are doing LED lighting replacements in those areas as well. So there's typically somewhere between a two to four year return on those LED lighting replacements. Um, you know, we've done it at Durham Station, and we've done it at a number of places. So, so that, that work is occurring. Additionally, we are working in collaboration with the fleet department to really look at, and Joe Clark has really been leading this effort, what our portfolio of vehicles could look like, what's happening in the heavy vehicle equipment arena that are possibilities, particularly for, for instance, solid waste vehicles. And so um, we are running down the track on a number of different initiatives. At the same time, we're trying to craft a master plan. And part of the work that we're doing with GDS Associates, while the final result will be delivered in May, we have asked that consultant through their work to daylight some early initiatives for us such that we would be able to include them in the budget cycle in this year. And so we will have some preliminary data come out on uh, the 15th of this month that sort of looks at some of our early opportunities. Um, additionally, we are looking at whether, you know, our trees that we are planting, we want to try to get some carbon offsets for those and sell those in the market. So we've got a number of initiatives going on at the same time we're trying to look at the entire portfolio. And I'll just pause there and see if that's sufficient or if you have further questions. Well, that, that was a killer answer. Uh, thank you. Um, those are great initiatives and I appreciate very much the fact that we are doing those things while we are uh, making this larger plan. That was exactly what I was interested in and, and I didn't know about all those things. I knew about some of them, but not all and I'm really appreciative. Let me also um, ask the, in the, the, you, you spoke last time about an RFI for um, to help uh, with an application for Green Source Advantage. What is Duke's role in helping us with that process? So Duke has been providing uh, to our consultant GDS Associates technical assistance on the crafting of the RFI in addition to um, helping us think about what partners might be available. So when you look on Duke's website, it indicates um, solar providers who may have an interest or may be a part of a program such that they might have capacity that we could take advantage of. And prior to releasing the RFI, they also did a full review on it to make sure that we hadn't missed anything, that we had clarity on those documents and are, are gonna help us as we move through the process. What's the timetable on that? So we issued the RFI on the first of this month, so a couple days ago. The responses are due on the 16th of this month, and then we will look at the responses and make some determinations on what the path ought to be moving forward. We are hoping to get some cost data as a part of the RFI, and we are interested to see what comes in, and we'll be doing an analysis on what the appropriate next steps might be from there. And I'm sure you don't know this exactly, but, and then how long does it take to, to work through the Green Source Advantage process and to actually get the allocation. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure my language here, Ms. Poston, but the allocation of the uh, megawatts. Yeah, and you're getting into an area that I, I don't have the answers for you. I certainly can gather that information and provide that to council, uh, laying out a schedule of what we think that timeline might look like. But 
I just, I haven't gotten deep enough into it to feel confident in the answer right now. That's fine. Um, getting down to um, a little more detail, uh, in the MOU attachment one, uh, in the attachment, you'll see there's a section on energy efficiency. Okay. And it talks about the tariff on bill pilot program. Can you, and you may, I don't know, you may want to call on uh, one of the Duke Energy folks that are here, uh, explain a little bit more about that. Yeah, I think it would be great to have one of my Duke partners, um, Indira, or one of her team, tell us a little bit more about that. The intention here is for us to create a pilot program and to test it. And if the pilot works, then we would ask for um, confirmation from whatever the regulatory agencies are to be able to continue that process. But I, I, I'd like to ask, see if some of my Duke team can respond here. And, and uh, I'm, I'm particularly interested in the fact that I, I'm, what I'm trying to understand is a little bit about this, the, the specific language. What is a tariff on bill pilot? program. I know what a pilot program is. Mm -hmm. Indira, are you out there? Well, I see Ms. Yes, Daniel. Yes, Christy, can you all hear me? Yes, Ms. Daniel and or Ms. Everett, either one. Mayor Schull, thank you for the opportunity to respond. My colleague Christy Daniels on the line and I think she can handle this question. Thank you. And Ms. Everett, I didn't see you here. We're glad to have you with us. Yes, sir. Ms. Daniel. Sure, thank you. So specifically your question is the on-bill financing pilot yes. program. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so this is something that Duke is evaluating and um, quite honestly has had limitations in the past because of our billing system, but we are in the process of updating our billing system so it'll have capabilities that we haven't been able to have before. So this is something that we'll be able to roll out um, as that system becomes available within the next uh, certainly within the next year. Um, so this is something where if a, if a customer would like something like a, a more efficient air conditioner, but they potentially couldn't afford to pay for that air conditioner all at once, it could be paid for along the course with their Duke Energy bill over time. So they would be able to get the benefits of a more efficient air conditioner and pay for that over the course of of their billing cycle, however long that might take. So that's it's kind of a, a financing that, so, so Duke in part is, is financing the project for energy efficiency. Thank you, that was very helpful. I wasn't quite, uh, I realized I didn't quite understand exactly what would be financed and that's extremely helpful, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I have another question uh, related to attachment one under the reliability and resilience section. Um, The, about the pilot program, such as solar arrays paired with battery storage on critical municipal facilities. I know that that is something of tremendous interest to all of us. Um, and I uh, would like to hear a little bit more about uh, either from the city, uh, I guess I'll start with Ms. Poston and then you may want to throw it over to Duke. Uh, but what is, our, what is our ambition here? I mean, this is super important technology. Uh, the change in battery storage is enabling a lot of uh, alternative energy uh, efficiencies. Uh, so, could you talk a little bit about that, Ms. Poso? What do we, when we when we what would you be thinking of here, and and uh, what would be piloted? Yeah, so this one I'm going to ask uh, Paul Cameron to weigh in and tell us a little bit more about that. You may remember that we received a grant earlier this year where we did some analysis on um, battery backup at City Hall and at um, the new police headquarters, sort of analyzing what the costs were and what sort of technology there was. Um, so let me just see if Paul can speak a little further on that. Mr. Cameron, are you able to be heard? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of council. Um, so uh, as, the mayor, as the mayor said, solar powered with battery storage is um, a fairly new technology, but that one that is growing in importance, particularly 
for resilience. Um, if, for example, um, if we can install um, solar panels paired with storage on key facilities, um, they can provide electricity in the event of a power outage. So for example, on city hall, police headquarters, critical facilities that we need to keep the power on in the event of a, a storm or a hurricane that uh, where there's a regional power outage, um, solar and battery storage can provide critical resilience capability um, in, in that situation. And this is something we did a, um, a pilot study last year with using a grant from um, the National League of Cities to do a study of that capability. And this is something that we could work with with Duke Energy on in the future to full explore that area more in depth and perhaps implement some of those projects on some of our key facilities. Thank you, Mr. Cameron. I'd like to ask now um, uh, someone from Duke, um, Ms. Everett, Ms. Daniel, whoever is appropriate, uh, what is Duke's level of interest in this? And what would you see your role as in terms of helping us make this a reality? Yeah, I can take that one if you want me to. Um, so uh, some of you might know, we recently filed an updated Carolina's resource plan. And in that plan were many different portfolios for how to decarbonize our fleet. And um, within that was a, a, a very large amount of renewable energy and storage technology. So, um, which doesn't exist today on our system. We don't, we hardly have any batteries. So this is of great interest to us. Um, and I think it only makes sense that the first places that we test and pilot um, these projects are with critical infrastructure. There are certainly other places that will look to do some of these projects, places on the grid that have various disruptive activity. Um, but certainly as we think about our, our critical infrastructure and making sure, as Paul said, we could keep it on um, in, in emergencies or in certain weather events, that would be beneficial. Uh, we, we have been able to get pilots approved um, in our jurisdiction in Florida and we are currently putting a battery system on, I believe it's a, um, a school or recreational center, but it's used in times of hurricanes for a place where um, elderly and, and folks in the community can go during a hurricane. So this is something that we are trying in other jurisdictions to do. And certainly, especially with the filing of our resource plan in North Carolina, we'll look to do even more so in, in North Carolina. Thank you, Ms. Daniel. That was very helpful. One more question about that. I don't, you know, the, the way in which this uh, technology is in its uses is described in the MOU, it is, it's, 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 um, context is just what you described in the example that you gave. Kind of emergencies, you know, a resilience issue. Um, isn't there other, um, you know, when I think about battery storage and the changes in battery storage, aren't there going to soon be much more far reaching uh, implications of this for, for uses far beyond thinking about kind of immediate, you know, emergencies and that, that sort of level of immediate resilience. And I was wondering what Duke's plans are there and how you see Durham fitting into that. Sure, absolutely, and, and you're right. I think, um, especially as the cost of battery storage, uh, we're projecting to come down significantly as it has been coming down. Um, of course, we always need to keep an eye on the future and making sure that we know what's gonna to happen to these batteries in 30 years. But um, the Carolinas are in an interesting um, area in the Southeast in that we can put a lot of solar on the system but our peak usage is not when the sun is shining right now. Um, it's, it's during those shoulder hours. So if we can come far enough along with our battery storage technology, such that we don't have to rely on other peak capacity generating systems that are by and large fossil generators today, 
um, then absolutely battery would be considered as a good peak resource um, to use on a broader scale uh, going forward. And what's, what do you, th as you look into the future on, on that issue, what do you think, how much time are we talking before, in your opinion, that sort of, that technology will be, be available for that kind of use? I won't hold you to it. <laughs> Thank you, because I'm not the engineer. But, um, you know, I would say that it's certainly within the 15 to 30 year time horizon. Um, and not, it's not all dependent upon technology. I think technology will help drive down costs as we get more efficient. Um, but we have to keep in mind, everybody across the country is trying to do the same thing. So making sure that we're deploying this efficiently um, is of great importance and making sure that we don't run into some situations as other states have where we um, start closing down other units too quickly without having that battery in place in order to perform that necessary peak capacity that it, it's needed for. So, I'm, but I, I certainly think that it's within the time horizon um, of, you know, getting within, within the 15 years, I think we'll start seeing it being dis deployed on a very large scale much sooner than 15 years. Um, but before we can really phase out potentially any reliance on fossil resources, that could be a while longer. Thank you. Um, Ms. Poston, uh, one of the other uh, key points in the examples of potential cooperation in the MOU and the attachment is the uh, electric vehicle charging stations uh, deployment. And I was wondering what you were thinking about and what, uh, what is our, what our, uh, in, in terms of that rollout. Um, are we talking about work that's ongoing now with Duke to try to figure out how to do that? I'm sure that there's a lot of, there are a lot of issues um, related to um, current demand and then inducing demand. I'm not sure all the how those economics work. I bet you Council Member Reese might have an idea. Uh, <laughs> but um, I, I wondered if you would like to make some comments about that very first example there in the attachment. Sure, thank you, Mayor. So we have installed a number of EV charging stations starting with uh, some federal funds that came down in uh, 07, 08, and 09. And then subsequent to that, we have been installing EV charging infrastructure as we build parking garages and in some of our surface lots and in some other places. And we've been starting to have conversations about um, how many we need to have of which types of things. I think we're um, just about to standardize the unit that we'd like to see installed in any of the city facilities such that we can begin doing some tracking and monitoring of what we have. We begin to have conversations about whether these charging stations on city property ought to have a fee associated with them or not. And so we're beginning to have conversations about that. We had applied for a grant with the state and we um, had been notified that we were gonna be receiving funding for four additional stations. And then the funding has been temporarily placed on hold. So we're optimistic that we're gonna receive some additional funding from that um, as, the, you know, as the taxes uh, come back online. So um, in terms of what the collaboration might look like with Duke, this is one of the things that we haven't had deep conversations with them specifically about what programs they have we might avail ourselves of and what their long-term strategies are so we can understand how we could dovetail what we're doing. Thank you. Um, is this the kind of thing that will be part of the energy action plan? A more, uh, is, is this an example of something that the energy action plan will fill out in terms of a range of timelines and costs and so forth? Yes, I believe we'll see information about our current fleet, what opportunities exist within our fleet. And then, you know, as we've been having general services been having one-on-one -on -one conversations with various departments and what needs to be in the budget next year, we've been talking about making sure we've got enough infrastructure in place so that when the buses come in, 
we can, and we're adding buses to our fleet that we have the infrastructure to do the electrical vehicle charging for those. So I think we're firing on a number of cylinders, whether it's transportation or fleet itself or general services. And I think this is a place where we have conversations with Duke about what, how, how these pieces dovetail together over the long term. Thank you. Once we have electric, electric vehicles, will we still be filing, firing on a number of cylinders or will that metaphor? Uh... Yes, I hear you. <laughs> um, so, um, okay, thank you. Um, let me just, I wanted to just make a few remarks uh, about this and where we are. Um, I really appreciated the speakers we've had tonight and I, I really appreciate uh, back in the end of last year and several months at the beginning of this year, I met a lot with a group of several groups of environmentalists and energy advocates. Uh, the EAB pulled people together, uh, but not just the EAB, the grandmas and grandpas for safe energy, not sure what their exact name is. Um, and um, the Sunrise Coalition, many, many groups, and really helped me form a vision for a Green New Durham, which I articulated as best that I could in my State of the City speech. And I really think that the, our staff did a wonderful job in uh, keeping those important points that were put forth by that group of people as part of this vision in the forefront as you were negotiating this franchise agreement and MOU. Uh, not all of the points uh, that I laid out there uh, are agreed to uh, by our partner, uh, Duke Energy in this MOU. Uh, and and honestly, the ones that are the that that are, the ones that are particularly not agreed to need regulatory and legislative change. Excuse me. Um, need legisla legislative or regulatory change. Um, I am appreciative that this week uh, there is some change in language in the MOU from the previous week, uh, which speaks to uh, the potential cooperation, cooperation to get that legislative or regulatory change, uh, cooperation between the city and Duke. Um, the, and the MOU is careful to say that that will be when our interests coincide, but I believe there will be times when our interests coincide and we will want to be working towards that regulatory and legislative change. Um, I was also pleased that um, I, I appreciate the remarks of Mr. LaCicero. I do wanna say that uh, another change that I see that I think is positive in the MOU is that Duke does acknowledge the reality of climate change. Um, if there are several places, I was just looking, um, this acknowledgement is I would say implicit, but, um, for example, addressing the challenges climate changes present is a mission on which both the city and Duke Energy agree. There are other places in the in the agreement where this kind of tacit acknowledgement of climate change, which I think is very important, uh, and our environmental uh, and energy folks did as well, uh, is in the agreement, and I am happy that that is true. Um, I do think that the language is 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 also advanced in terms of the uh, community solar and Duke's commitment to help us make that a reality. So I'm very appreciative of those changes. And I, I feel that the language is very strong. Um, Tom Campbell mentioned this in his comments. I think we have very strong language now around our ability to, uh, the city's ability, uh, the, our, our ability to uh, produce, purchase solar power, including from independent producers. And I think that's gonna be really important to us going ahead, including as we get involved in the Green Source Advantage program. Um, and I think being, you know, getting to the top of that line, uh, as we've discussed, Ms. Poston, 
uh, with this, with the limited number of megawatts available and no guarantee of more soon is going to be important. And so I'm very glad that we have the RFI out. Um, again, uh, Mr. Campbell said that the proof will be in the performance, and I think that's true. I think in terms of what we, what our staff has negotiated and, and what Duke has negotiated with us, I think we're about as good as it's going to be. Um, it is true, as Mr. LaCicero said, that this does not give us all the power and freedom that we would want, but we are not in that situation. We're in a situation where Duke Energy is our monopoly energy provider. Uh, they're heavily regulated and uh, in a heavily regulated industry and our state legislature is not friendly to many of the things that we would like to do. And because of those things, we don't have the independent power and freedom to do everything we'd like to do on energy. But insofar as we do, uh, in, in so far as we uh, we are free uh, to create our own energy future, and we do have some power in that realm, I think our staff has done a really great job uh, in negotiating for us to get those things. Uh, and I'm very, uh, I think we're, we've, I'm really appreciative. I appreciate of you, Bo, because I know you, Bo Ferguson, because I know you um, did so much to pull all this together uh, to, uh, to Ms. Poston, to Ms. Probst, Mr. Cameron, um, and also to the folks uh, at Duke uh, who worked with us on this. And I want to thank Ms. Everett, Ms. Daniel, and others for uh, being a part of this, because I think this MOU is a huge advance from, well, let's just say, right today, we don't have this MOU. Once we approve this, we will have this MOU. It is a huge advance, I think, in our potential uh, energy future. So I want to express my gratitude. Uh, and uh, Ms. Everett, would you like to say something? Yes, sir. Mr. Mayor, I would to you and uh, all the city council members. Thank you all uh, for allowing us this opportunity. I want to just echo some comments you made and kind of end on a collaborative note. Certainly, as you said, the staff, the city, of Durham staff has been phenomenal to work with. And I want to thank them again. I said that a couple sessions back and it bears saying again, they have been exceptional to work with. And so we appreciate that. They've worked in a very professional manner um, and have been very collaborative. And that I have to echo again is well received. Our leadership certainly appreciates that. I personally appreciate that. I also want to mention, as I want to thank my colleague, Christy, for being on the call. She is a subject matter expert for the subject that she was referring to. I do want to make the city council aware, and you, perhaps you are aware, that we started a Duke Climate Collaborative maybe a year or two ago, and Christy actually started that and led that. Our CEO felt climate change was so important that she actually tapped Christy to lead that organization. Um, my colleague Tanya Evans now is kind of uh, spearheading that, but we have in that a very diverse group of, um, of stakeholders. We have Buncombe County, we have Asheville, we have Raleigh, we have Cary, and we have Durham County. And just to make you and our city council aware, we added the city of Durham as well. And so there will be a representative there to the question about how do we move forward collaboratively, uh, it will be proof in the pudding, if you will. We want you at the table. And so we've extended that. We will have a representative from the city of Durham also joining the Durham County representative as a part of that collaborative because we're very sincere about wanting to work with you. And so a lot of the, the proof in the pudding and the work plan and the action plan, that's where that's really gonna happen. And so we're sincere about that. And so I'm not sure the whole council was aware of that, but we made that offer. Um, actually, we presented it a couple years ago, um, but we're glad that that's finally come to fruition. And so we welcome them as a part of that team that's helping to address all these matters that we're talking about tonight. So I, I won't continue to belabor the point, but I do wanna say thank you to your staff. They've been exceptionally um, professional and we've enjoyed working with them. Thank you very much, Ms. Everett. 
we love hearing compliments for our staff and uh, we know that they're true. And um, thank you for letting us know about being invited to the table uh, at the Climate Action Group. Absolutely. Um, colleagues, um, I see that Mr. Ferguson has put in the chat, many thanks as well to the excellent team from the city attorney's office, Fred Lamar and Don O'Toole. Yes, I should have mentioned that and I apologize. Thank you so much to Mr. O'Toole and Mr. Lamar. We know how much you've put into this. All right, uh, colleagues, I have, I have burned a lot of airtime, but I'm now gonna ask for other questions and comments that you all might have. Council Member Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I don't wanna uh, say as much as you did because you said a lot of things and asked a lot of great, very detailed questions. Um, I guess I'm just wanted to thank our staff for working so hard um, on getting this agreement to where it is today. Um, especially want to thank Bo Ferguson um, and with our deputy city manager and uh, Stacy Poston, who I guess to, I can't remember a bigger uh, council meeting for Stacy Poston than this one tonight um, as we complete this agreement with Duke Energy that she's been deeply involved with um, kind of in the nuts and bolts. And then also um, we just in, in, as part of the consent agenda approved the conveyance of the old the police headquarters on West Chapel Hill. Uh, two projects that she has been uh, deeply involved in. And so many thanks to you, Stacy. I don't know what you're going to do to fill your time from, from here on out, but I'm sure you'll find something. I um, also want to thank um, Indira Everett and the folks at Duke Energy uh, for being um, such good negotiating partners. Um, I've talked to Indira about, Indira, I've talked to you about the our staff's work on this project, um, and you were very uh, effusive about your praise with them and what a, what a, what a, tough bargaining team they were, but I think that's got to go both ways. Uh, we're not going to reach an agreement like this without uh, a partner on the other side who just wants to get to the right answers, and I appreciate the work that Duke Energy did to get that. Um, and perhaps just as importantly, I want to thank the folks in the community, especially in the Environmental Affairs Board um, and Tom Campbell, former member of this body, uh, for pushing us and the staff, pushing the staff to, 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 to push harder but also pushing us as council members individually to push staff to push harder. Uh, and I think what you have seen over the last two weeks um, is the impact of that pressure. Um, and so I think that's how this is supposed to work. And I'm really, uh, really honored that we live in a community with folks who are willing to get down into the very nitty gritty details of these agreements to talk to us as electeds and staff um, at a very technical level about where shortcomings are and how they can be addressed. And also really happy that staff um, made a number of adjustments to the agreement since we last saw it to address many of those concerns. And finally, Mr. Mayor, I just wanna, wanna harken back to something that Mr. Campbell said. You hi highlighted it a couple of times. Agreements on paper are great. They um, have to be hammered out between negotiating partners uh, to reach uh, mutual goals. And that's done, that's what's happened here. But the real test of this agreement um, is the will of the two negotiating partners to make it real once the ink is dry. Um, and I think we have to accept the burden as, as the city of Durham for continuing to push our partner, Duke Energy, to make this agreement what we need it to be in order to have a world to live in for the next generation. Um, you know, we passed a sustainability, um, a set of sustainability goals not too long ago. And unless we change the, the legislative rules around how power is generated, how it's stored, how it's bought and sold, we're never going to get there. This agreement puts us on a path to getting there. This is really, in my mind, the first huge step in getting to those goals. Uh, but we, but like I said, once the ink is dry, we still have a huge responsibility to continue to push Duke Energy, to continue to work with other municipalities, to pressure both the legislature here in North Carolina and also the U.S. Congress in Washington, D.C., to make it easier for producers to produce green energy, for cities to produce, buy and sell it. Um, that's how we're going to get to the future we need, along with lots of other things around transit, land use, and, and whatnot. So all of that is to say that, that for the time that we are on this body, we will have personal responsibility for continuing to push this system forward. But we also, our community has to continue to do what EAB and Mr. Campbell and others have done throughout this entire agreement negotiating process, which is to push us, hold us accountable for 
making the kind of changes at the local, state, and federal level that will make this agreement, help this agreement build us a world that we can, that our kids can live in. And so all of that is to say that, that to the people of Durham, continue to hold us accountable. Um, we, none of us will be in these seats um, to see that next generation. And so the people of Durham have to continue to elect representatives to the city council at every level of government who are committed to making the changes we need to save our planet. Uh, this is an important step in that direction. I intend to support it tonight. And I just wanna thank everybody involved and thank my colleagues. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much for those comments, council member, and they were very, very well said. All right, other comments by members of the council or questions for staff, council member Middleton, and then council member Freeman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Charlie, Pierce and Jillian are like 12, so they'll be here uh, for the next generation. <laughs> um, Mr. Mayor, thank you for your, your questioning uh, of folk tonight. You know, this whole matter, a recurring motif for me during this whole matter was don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, but this deal has actually gotten gooder. Uh, there was a point at which I thought the, the good threshold was crossed. Uh, some time ago, but um, it's gotten gooder, -er, and, and I'm grateful for uh, the work of the staff. I, I think two things that are evident uh, that's been made clear to me or clearer to me is the the absolute, um, absolutely phenomenal staff we have when they're given the charge to negotiate and act on our behalf. And I also want to want to recognize the good corporate corporate citizenship of Duke Energy as well. I think I think those two things came together. Uh, and have given us not a perfect, but a, but a very good deal, I think. And I'm I'm confident that when I read the MOU in tension with the actual franchise agreement, both documents kind of in in, in a conversation with one another, uh, I'm confident that we're at a good place to um, champion our values when it comes to the climate and the environment uh, moving forward, and still giving our city agility. So I look forward to supporting uh, uh, this uh, this agreement. Um, I want to thank. Uh, the EAB, because I, I think th this is a, a, a prime example of why activism is so important and why organizing and continuing to push governments when they say this is all as far as, as much as we can do to keep pushing them uh, to go further. So I'm glad uh, we didn't sell, uh, settle just that good, that it's gotten gooder uh, because of the excellence of our staff and, and members of the community. So thank you, uh, everyone involved for such an incredible, incredible piece of work uh, that I think will do us good if we keep vigilant and do what we need to do. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Freeman. Thank you. I won't echo all the accolades um, that have already been heaped on, I, I agree. I wanted to uh, just take a moment and step to the side on this conversation a little bit, just acknowledging that this evening, um, most if not all of this conversation has been translated into Spanish and, and many of our Spanish speaking countries, this might not be the conversation that they're having at this moment. So I just want to acknowledge that um, there's some there's some differences in the conversations or some some um, just noting that the the time that we're spending and having these conversations builds our community in a stronger way. It builds our our ability to understand and have the knowledge as the sub subject matter experts spoke this evening, many of us are not those subject matter experts. And so I appreciate um, all the questions and all of the wherewithal of our staff to get us to this point. And uh, the way in which I know whenever I ask the questions to Indira Everett at Duke Energy, um, I get answers. I just, I just wanna note that this is a, this is a, a very first world issue and a very um, good opportunity to help um, shed light on, on how clean energy is a, is a huge or a huge aspect of where we are going. But I also wanna make sure that we tie it back to so that it, re it actually relates to people in the community that aren't quite there yet and understanding how clean energy and um, all the aspects of what we're talking about this evening relates to where they are and how, how they operate on a daily basis. And so just tracking back to one aspect of the conversation where it was discussed about how uh, folks might be able to actually add an air conditioner 
or an energy efficiency, uh, energy efficient refrigerator in their home, it's important to note that I think um, our gas, I think it's Dominion Energy, has been offering that type of services. And if that's the service that's being offered by Duke Energy, that's a phenomenal addition. And then also noting that there were there were a couple of other things that uh, I kind of got lost. I know that uh, Steve was talking for a while. I tried to keep up, but um, and sorry about that. <laughs> but just noting that there there, I just want to make sure that we don't lose our everyday uh, folks issues in these conversations because they don't always press forward in a way that's organized like a. Um, EAB board member or um, the people who who are who are at the fringes on these on these issues, but it is important for folks to understand how it relates. And so I just want to make sure that we're also making this this information as readily available to people in the community so that they are following along. Because when we talk about three thousand lumens and four thousand lumens, it can get a little over over like overwhelming. But the the impact that it has is important and I think that the loss that we would we would experience if we don't make sure that this information is available not just um, in English and in Spanish but in other languages but also just just connecting more of the dots so that so that there are more people around this conversation than than just the people who are very focused on energy efficiency or or solar or what have you. I think I'm making, I think I'm going a long way on the way to say that we should all be involved in this conversation and we have to find ways to do that. Thank you, Thank you very much, council member. Um, any other questions or comments at this time? I will, uh, I, I will ask, uh, I, I do want to just follow up a little bit about the lights. Um, this is not our main topic tonight by any means, but we have had a number of people. Uh, Ms. Foreman was here to talk about that, and we've also had uh, a good number of emails. And then, Mr. Judge, uh, yesterday, I believe, you sent the memo to us, or maybe it was Friday. It was over the weekend, perhaps, um, that spoke to uh, the many of the issues that have been raised about the lighting. And um, I appreciate that very much. Thank you for making that available to us. And um, I've been really uh, holding back on uh, answering uh, a, a lot of these emails until I had that uh, information which you gave to us recently, but uh, getting that in writing is very helpful. Uh, one of the issues that the folks raise in, the, in, in terms of the lighting uh, is the health issue. And your uh, memo addresses pretty much everything that people said, uh, but with the health issue, um, I'm paraphrasing here, basically says, uh, what does it say? It doesn't have a, it doesn't have a, a, a clear answer on that. Uh, can you talk to us through about that a little bit? Yes, Bill Judge, transportation. Uh, so we are aware of that 2016 AMA study and recommendation. Uh, to my knowledge, that's there hasn't been any subsequent um, additional information provided by the American Medical Association or any other studies. Um, we have asked Duke Energy about it. Obviously, it's something that is concerning to us. Um, but the industry standard, I guess, continues to be the 4,000 Kelvin even since that study came out, um, Duke did indicate that the, uh, uh, there's a group that, um, yeah, sorry, I'm drawing a blank on it, but it's like Illumination Society, yeah, the Illuminating Engineering Society, um, which is sort of the foremost research group related to lighting has offered to partner with the American Medical Association to do further research. Uh, but to my knowledge, nothing has been produced at this point. Um, the 4,000 Kelvin, like, like I said, it's the industry standard. There's probably, yeah, at least, yeah, I won't say it's 100%, but close to 100% of the LED street lights around the country are most likely pretty close to the 4,000 Kelvin. Um, there, there's probably a few others that are a little bit different, but, um, but it's by far the vast majority. 
um, including here in Durham. We, we've been using them since uh, late 2014. We had almost a thousand of them installed prior to starting this conversion program. And the conversion program at this point is 85 or 90% complete. Yes, there's a little over 2,000 remaining as of last week. I wasn't able to get an updated number before tonight, but they're anticipating, assuming that there's not significant storms or hurricanes where they have to pull crews off here and during the month of October, that they will likely be finished by around the 1st of November. And the, uh, the shield costs about $100 a piece to put on, is that correct? Yes, it varies depending on the wattage of the light, but um, the for the vast majority of them, they're just under $100. Some of the, the larger lights are a little bit more than $100, but. And the, um, talk a little bit about the finances of the lighting replacement. I'm sorry, uh, yeah, about the, about the current lighting program. Yeah, so I mean, um, the lighting is paid for. There's a monthly fee that um, the city is charged for each light and that basically Duke owns, maintains and operates the lighting. Um, so they're responsible for, for all maintenance. So the city pays a, a monthly service fee for, for each light. And um, that's funded through, through the city's general fund through our department. What are the economics of the new lights as good for, for, to the city, for the city? Uh, as opposed to the old lights? So um, for the replacements, they're really, it's a, pretty much close to a break even. The uh, some, depending on the wattage, some lights we save some money, other, watt, other wattages we pay a little bit more. Um, the net reduction or conversion of 21,000 had a, just a very slight overall increase to our budget, but um, was actually smaller than a typical rate increase. So um, it was really almost basically break even on that. There is a $40 conversion fee though, in addition to any of those shields that, that we're paying. So we were able to budget for that. So um, we have to, we pay Duke Energy $40 for, for each of light that they're converting. So over the, over the um, period of time of the um, conversion process, the expense to the city was Let's see, uh, how many lights? 20,000? Yeah, it was uh, just 40, over 21,000. $800,000 uh, over time. Yes, the, so there was a the, the $40 one-time fee was, um, it was 800 and some thousand dollars, um, about 850, I think, if I recall with the, um, so, and that's actually Duke. Um, there's an option through the North Carolina Utilities Commission where it's actually spread over four years. So we're, we're paying one fourth of that each year to, to help recoup. And some people have said we should put, you know, we've received some emails that said we should, you know, replace all those lights. Any light that we replace, I assume, would have a, also a one-time replacement fee. I mean, not, I'm not sure what the other replacement light would be, but Yes, yeah, so we do have to, when we get asked for request service on a new light, we do agree to pay for a minimum of 36 months of service for that light. So if we were to basically ask them to remove it or retire it early, um, we would be subject to, to paying that 36 months of service for whatever the remainder is from the time they, they install it. Is that in addition to the $40 per light installment? That, that would be if um, like I said, normally it's just billed monthly through a bill that they send to us directly. Um, it, depending whether it's a new pole, existing pole underground, that they vary, but in general, it's generally about $20 per light per month. And so, so is that then, uh, just to be clear, is that on top of the $40 replacement fee would be a $20 per month fee as well? Or is that the same thing as the $40? Yeah, so if we if there's no light there and we go out and we request them to install a new light, it's about $20 per month per light. The $40 is just where we've asked them to replace a high pressure sodium light with an LED. It's a one time fee to help them recoup some of the cost of retiring those high pressure sodium equipment early. Just to just to make I'm sorry to belabor this, yeah. but just to make sure I understand. Um, the forty dollars is for, to replace a light. Um, if people are writing us and saying you should replace all these lights with something else, 
this, let's don't argue about what the something else is, but if we were to do that, we would pay, I assume, a $40 replacement fee. Would we also have to pay other fees to replace a light of three months operating in addition to that, or is that $40? It, yeah, it would probably be something in between those two, closer to the three months of service, I mean, the 36 months of service. Uh, so the $40 was um, a fee that the North Carolina Utilities Commission, not knowing, you know, a light on one street might have only been two or three years old and the light on another street might have been 20 years old. So it it was basically just an average for all their equipment throughout Duke Energy's Carolinas and a fee that, that they were allowed to charge. So um, since this is all essentially brand new equipment that's been installed within the within the last year, I think they would most likely Duke would look for us to, to pay the remainder of that initial 36 months of service. And that 36 months of service is payable at how much per month? Um, for uh, It varies depending on the light. Um, there, some are as little as $10 a month, but um, and others are yeah, a little over 20, depending whether it's underground service, overhead service, existing poles, and the wattage. But, okay. So it could be up to, it could be $360 to make a replacement because you'd have to pay the, we would have to pay the service. Correct. It could or more than that if it was 20, per light. Or more than that if it was $20 per month. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry to belabor this, but I really want to give a good answer to our, our residents who've been asking questions. Yeah. House Member Reese. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, thank you. I appreciate you bringing the, the light issue back up. Um, I realize that we are almost to the end of the replacement program. And so my, um, my opinion that we should stop while we figure out how to fix the problem that many of our residents are having with this is likely about to be moot. Um, but I do think it makes sense for, and I'm, and I hope that we can figure out what it, what it takes for the folks who live on a street. Are, that is serviced by one of these lights to tell the city that they think it's too bright and and figure out how to get a dimmer light in that location. I don't think that's too much to ask. Um, I think it, as you pointed out, it could be expensive. Um, I'd like to see some actual numbers behind it. Mr. Judge, I absolutely trust you and your reading of the contract, but there seemed like there was a lot of estimation going on there. And I'd like to maybe have somebody have a conversation with Duke Energy about what would it actually take to replace one of these bulbs that many of our residents feel are too bright with something that's less bright. So um, I think that may be where I think we ought to be heading uh, with the conversation, um, just because um, you know this is something that we're hearing from a lot of folks. And I, I at least wanna know what it takes to help a group of neighbors advocate for that change and what it takes on the city side to make that change a reality. So, that's that's my two cents on that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, I appreciate that. And Mr. Judge, maybe you could give that some thought, and you all could get back to us on that, unless you wanted to offer anything now. Uh, no, I would need to follow up with Duke Energy. As I said, the the service agreement we signed does specify meant that we would pay for it for a minimum of thirty six months. Um, obviously, if, depending on the number of locations, I think uh, they might be able to negotiate something in between that. Thank you very much. I think that, um, you know, the, yeah, the other question is the, the, um, the baffles, I can't remember what they're called, that, that, that uh, make the light dimmer. What are they called, Mr. Judge? Yeah, we they call them shields, essentially. Shields, to shields help yeah. Shield the light. Yeah, I mean, I think that that is maybe our cheapest good option. Ms. Page. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, the administration would be happy to um, bring a presentation to council later uh, regarding the lights. We've been listening very carefully to all the questions about the light lighting and we will schedule a, a work session uh, presentation uh, that will be responsive to the questions that have come up regarding Super. the light. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. 
Mr. Mayor, I don't know if you can see my hand. Yes, I can, Council Member. Uh, uh, you're you're up. Just want to make sure that in that presentation that it's included a way to engage the folks who are around those lights. Because if you're just speaking to one person and then the neighbor wants something different, I don't want to be the one making that decision for for the neighbor between neighbors. And so I, I, I'm, I'm mindful of how these things happen in many neighborhoods and the folks who are on the negative side are the loudest and folks on the positive side aren't. And I don't wanna be in between that. And so I just wanna make sure that that conversation is held in a way that's very open and forthright with the people in the community. So thank you. Thank you, council member. Colleagues, I know that I have used way more than my share of time, but I hope you all will forgive me because I don't usually. Um, so uh, are there any other questions or comments about the, um, about the franchise agreement? Uh, Council Member Freeline. Well, it's not about the franchise agreement, but I was just thinking um, just off the top of my head about uh, when to tell folks we can expect to have that presentation about the lights. You know, I'm, I'm anticipating a, a response to several of those emails and uh, wanting to give folks, uh, you know, a goalpost to look forward to. Um, maybe that's a question for city manager Page, or I'm not sure. I believe it is. Thank you, good question. So uh, as it relates to the timing of it, we, um, we do have quite a few presentations coming up uh, at work sessions. So we wanna make sure that we're mindful of that. And I'd also like to speak to uh, the, the staff to see how long it would really take uh, to put put a quality uh, presentation that's responsive to all the questions with with all of the engagement. So um, we can get back with a date. Uh, we could probably have a date uh, just you know a, for conversation uh, by a date by Thursday as to when we might be ready to come back with that presentation. Thank you. Thank you, council member, and thank you, Ms. Page. Colleagues, if there are no further questions or comments, I wanna declare this public hearing closed. And the matter is now before the council for a vote. I'm going to ask our city attorney, uh, we have several things to do, uh, and I wonder if we could do them in a single vote. The, those things would be to adopt an ordinance granting a franchise to Duke Energy Carolinas, to authorize the city manager to enter into an operating agreement, to authorize the city manager to enter into a memorandum of understanding and to authorize the city manager to make modifications to the operating agreement and or the memorandum of understanding did not significantly affect the intent of the agreement. Can we do that in a single motion? Honestly, Mr. Mayor, I, I would prefer that you all take them up in the order in which they're listed sequentially. Gotcha, we'll do that. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Madam Attorney. Uh, I'll now accept a motion to adopt an ordinance granting a franchise to Duke Energy Carolinas. So moved. Second. Second. So moved by Council Member Freeman, seconded by Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Uh, and uh, Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Mayor Shul. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Aye. Council Member Caballero. Aye. Council Member Freelon. Aye. Council Member Freeman. Aye. Council Member Middleton. I vote aye. Council Member Reese. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The ayes have it and the motion passes unanimously. We'll now move to authorize the city manager enter to an operating agreement with Duke Energies Carolina. Can so moved. Second. Moved by, Council, by Mayor Pro Tem Johnson, seconded by Council Member Caballero. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Mayor Shul. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Caballero. Aye. Councilmember Freelon. Aye. Councilmember Freeman. Aye. Councilmember Middleton. I vote aye. Councilmember Reese. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The ayes have it. The motion passes unanimously. And now we'll move to authorize the city manager to enter to an operating agreement with Duke Energy Carolinas LLC. So moved. Second. 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 Moved by Mayor Pro Tem Johnson, seconded by Council Member Reese. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Mayor Shul. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Aye. 
Councilmember Caballero? Aye. Councilmember Freelon? Aye. Councilmember Freeman? Aye. Councilmember Middleton? I vote aye. Councilmember Reese? Aye. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The ayes have it. The motion passes unanimously. And now um, we will need a motion to authorize the city manager to make modifications to the operating agreement and or the memorandum of understanding that do not significantly alter the intent of the agreement. So moved. Thank you. Okay. Uh, moved by Councilmember Freeman, seconded by Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Mayor Shul. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Caballero. Aye. Councilmember Freelon. Aye. Councilmember Freeman. Aye. Councilmember Middleton. I vote aye. Councilmember Reese. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. I believe those are all the motions that we need. I want to one more time thank our uh, negotiating partners and our community partners at Duke Energy. I want to thank all the people and our staff who've done such an amazing job city attorney's office, general services, and others. And I want to thank our community members, uh, as Council Member Reese put it so eloquently, who have helped us. One name I did not call amongst the community members who've been so active is Casey Collins. I think Casey's had as big an impact on this agreement as anyone, and I want to really appreciate Casey's work from the Environmental Affairs team. All righty. Thank you so much. Um, you. Everybody who's involved in this, I suggest that you go out and have a an adult beverage of your choice. All righty, uh, and now we will move on to consolidated annexation Leesville Road assemblage. This is also a public hearing item. I wanna remind everyone that this public hearing uh, is, is open from a previous meeting. Uh, and so we don't need to open the public hearing. It is open as of now. Uh, Ms. Smith, welcome. Um, good evening, Mayor and City Council members. I'm here presenting this item tonight. Ms. Struthers is not available to join us. So I will begin if that's okay. Yes, please. Okay. So I'm Grace Smith with the Planning Department and I will be presenting Leesville Road Assemblage. It was continued from City Council meeting on September the 8th. Before I begin, I would like to state for the record that all of the Planning Department notices have been executed in accordance with state and local law and the affidavits for those are on file in the Planning Department. So this is a request for utility extension agreements, voluntary annexation, and a zoning map change from Tim Sivers of Four Bath Associates for a total of 11 parcels, generally, generally located at 6325 Leesville Road. 10 of the parcels are part of the zoning map change proposal, while one parcel to the south of Leesville Road has been included to avoid creating a donut hole. Two utility extension agreements have been requested one for a larger, the larger assemblage and one for 6408 Leesville Road, that's the Southern parcel. The annexation petition is for a contiguous expansion of the corporate city limits. The applicant proposes to change the zoning designation of the 10 parcel sign rural residential to plan development residential 3.236, excuse me, six, with a development plan committing to a maximum of 344 units. No change is proposed to the future land use map designation of low density residential, which is consistent with the zoning request. If approved, the annexation petition and associated applications would become effective on December 31st, 2020. The city and county operational departments have reviewed this request. The budget and management services department determined that the proposed annexation will become revenue positive immediately following annexation if it were approved. Additional information on the service and fiscal impacts can be found in the staff report. The Durham Planning Commission recommended approval on the, of the proposed zoning by a vote of eight to four at their March 10th, 2020 meeting. There are three motions required for this application. The first is to adopt an ordinance annexing the property and entering, in, and entering into two utility extension agreements. The second is to adopt the consistency statement and the third is for the zoning ordinance. Uh, thank you and staff is available for questions and it's my understanding that the applicant is here and may have a presentation to share. Thank you so much, Ms. Smith. Uh, I, I will remind you all that the public hearing is open. Um, and I have signed up to speak on this item four people, uh, Mr. Tim Sivers, Bao Hong Wan, Jonathan Hayward, and Todd Alsop, I believe are the four. 
let me ask now, um, is there anyone else who is a attendee at this meeting who would like to speak on this item? And if so, could you raise your virtual hand or make yourself heard in the chat? Is there anyone else um, who would like to be heard? Um, I believe that all four people have signed up are proponents and may be part of your team, Mr. Sivers. Madam Clerk, can we make Mr. Sivers available to be heard? He's unmuted. Thank you. Mr. Sivers, um, are the four people that uh, yourself, Val Hong Wan, Jonathan Hayward, and Todd Alsop, are all of those part of your team? Yes, sir, that is correct. Uh, are they all planning to speak or are they here to answer questions? No, we're all available for questions. I have a few, uh, about a three or four minute uh, presentation, but everybody else is available for questions. All right. Mr. Sivers, it's been a while since we've discussed this. Uh, and so I think a presentation would be in order. Uh, and especially if you could uh, refresh us on uh, some of the key points. Yes, thank you, sir. Um, um, sorry, Mayor Shul and City Council members, I have the presentation and can share my screen whenever Mr. Sivers is ready. Super, Ms. Smith, thank you so much. Why don't you go ahead and do that? Is, are you ready for that, Mr. Sivers? Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, again, my name is Tim Sivers with Horvath Associates, 16 Consultant Place, Durham, North Carolina. The request in front of you this evening, uh, next slide, please. The request in front of you this evening is a rezoning of 107.24 acres from RR to PDR 3.236 and an annexation of nearly 114 acres. This project is located on the north side of Leesville Road, east of Del Webb Arbors Drive and west of Andrews Chapel Road. The area includes large track single family as well as many single family home developments. The project's located about two miles away from Briar Creek and four miles to the Ravenstone Shopping Center on NC 98. Next slide, please. The proposed density of 3.236 fits within the city's designation area of low density residential for the area. Therefore, no change is needed to the future land use map. This project is compatible with the existing land use patterns along Leesville Road and is consistent with the intents, goals, and principles of the adopted plans. Based on the presentation by the planning director to the city council on September 24th, this townhome use and density is also consistent with the expectations of future development in this area, while higher density, office, and commercial is anticipated closer to the NC 98 Highway 70 corridors. Next slide, please. The proposed density will provide a maximum of 344 units, and the developers now are a contract with KB Homes to build this townhome development with prices anticipated in the mid 200s That'll bring additional product type to the adjacent single family home developments. Next slide, please. The development plan illustrates right of way dedication, landscape buffers, tree preservation area, maximum of 344 units, open space areas, stream crossings, as well as access points onto Leesville Road and adjacent parcels for future connectivity. The development has over 1400 linear feet of road frontage in which turn lanes, bike lanes, and sidewalks will be constructed. The existing two and three lane road will be widened to four lanes at our access points to provide east and westbound turn lanes. In addition, a right turn lane will also be constructed at Andrews Chapel Road, along with a signal warrant analysis for this intersection. Next slide, please. The second application includes the contiguous annexation of the 113.7 acres. This encompasses the entire project area, as well as the landscape nursery on the south side of the Leesville Road. This parcel is included in the annexation to eliminate the creation of a donut hole within the city limits. Next slide, please. A summary of the key tax commitments consists of 5,000 linear feet of nature trails, programmed open space as illustrated, a minimum of one traffic calming device, shorter block lengths, not to exceed 600 feet, additional asphalt on Leesville Road for future bike lanes, traffic improvements along Leesville Road, as well as a $19,000 contribution to the Durham Public Schools. Next slide, please. As discussed in the previous meeting, this slide identifies the revised and new text commitments that have been reviewed and accepted by staff. 
They include clarification that this is a townhouse residential development, increase in our tree preservation area to 24% to include areas outside the stream buffers, and increase the contribution of their dedicated housing fund by 25% to $43,000, in addition to three architectural commitments to provide variation in home appearance. Next slide, please. This proposal is consistent with the goals and policies of the comprehensive plan, and it's also consistent with the planning department's expectations of future development in this area. It provides the opportunity for additional housing choices while supporting our growing population for our city. This project has neighborhood support and I believe you received emails in that manner. I do request that you follow planning commission's recommendation for approval of this project and vote in favor of this development. If there are any questions, the developer, traffic engineer and myself are available to answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sivers for that. Um, Refresh your presentation, we appreciate getting it. Colleagues, you have heard the report from staff and you have heard the uh, presentation from the applicant. Um, I do not believe there are any other speakers here on this item. Uh, so I'll now ask if there are any questions or comments for staff or the applicant by members of the council. Any questions or comments at this point? All right. Um, if not, I will close this public hearing. Uh, I'm now going to declare this public hearing closed and the matter is now back before the council. Um, there would be three motions necessary on this item. One would be to adopt the ordinance of annexing Leesville Road Assemblage second to adopt the consistency statement, the third to adopt an ordinance amending the UDO. Do I have a motion? Move to adopt the ordinance. Is there a second? Seconded. Moved by council member Middleton, seconded by council member Freeline that we adopt the ordinance annexing the Leeville Road assemblage. Is there any discussion, any more discussion, any comments council members? Councilmember Caballero. I just wanted to share with colleagues that I did, I was able to watch the work session presentation on Searles and heard the really wonderful discussion afterwards. Staff did not debrief me, but it was because I did not follow up with questions. Previous to the Searles um, presentation, I had spoken with several uh, individual staff members. So I felt um, pretty good after hearing that, that kind of comprehensive uh, update from both, well, really from all three water transportation and planning and just wanted to thank staff because it was super super helpful to put all of that all the different pieces in context and all the great questions uh colleagues had afterwards so i just wanted to thank everyone for that you're muted mr mayor thank you council member caballero other other comments um uh, council member reese Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I wanna thank uh, staff for bringing this back to us and thank Mr. Sivers for his willingness to let us take a pause before we considered this and a, number, a series of other um, projects uh, in this area. Um, I just felt like it was necessary for me to say just a couple of words because I was one of the members of this council who had expressed some deep concerns about this kind of development in this part of Durham. I think one of the things that I mentioned uh, when we talked about this at our work session is that so often um, is that very seldom do we get um, our staff to talk to us about what a particular area of Durham um, is well suited to bear in terms of development. Uh, so much of what we do is very um, transactional. It is, this is the case we're on today. Um, vote yes or no on this case. Um, and I think it was the mayor pro tem who expressed a frustration about that mode of uh, kind of building out uh, the city, uh, in this case, part of the county that uh, wants to be part of the city. Um, and I think that what we that that need that presentation and the conversation we had afterwards was a great example of what I hope we'll start to do more of um, in the weeks and months ahead because it really gave me a good sense of the, 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 the 
risks and the costs of developing uh, these types of projects in this part of Durham and the benefits. Uh, and not only that, but it also gave me a better sense of the risk of not uh, doing this kind of uh, residential development here. What other type of residential development is possible uh, without annexation, um, especially what we can see just on the other side of the Wake County line in the same part uh, of our state. And so all that having been said, uh, I believe it is in our city's best interest to uh, annex this property pursuant to the, to the plan that's before us. I wanna thank uh, the, the applicant for uh, being mindful of some of the design commitments that I talked uh, to Mr. Cybers about uh, some, some months ago now, uh, the types of concerns that are often raised um, by Commissioner Miller uh, at the Planning Commission. I wanna appreciate that. And obviously we see the project now in a different light than the Planning Commission did because there was no builder there then and now there is. Uh, and so a lot of those concerns have been addressed and I intend to support them as you're done. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much, council member. Any other comments, Mayor Pro Tem? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just wanted to also appreciate the staff for the comprehensive presentation that we received on the Searles area. I um, feel a lot more comfortable now moving forward with some of these cases and I'm also looking forward to the work that we're gonna do um, on the small area plan for, for the region. Um, and yeah, I just wanna um, agree with council member Reese that it's really nice to have this sort of broad overview of what's happening in an area rather than the kind of piecemeal case by case um, work that we usually get. And just wanna appreciate the staff for that um, big picture and just say I found it very helpful. Thank you, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Any other comments before we vote? Ma uh, Council Member Freeman. Thank you. I um, I also did follow up with staff as I, I had a chance to review the presentation and hear comments. And I have been as torn as I will be moving forward um, on each of these cases, acknowledging that not only do we need small area planning, but we need a comprehensive plan and acknowledging how fragile our waterways are and where all of this development is. The 300 and some odd townhomes in this area just doesn't feel appropriate. And I can't afford, I unfortunately cannot support moving forward with that. But I do know that the, the need for residential um, housing near and close to that border is, is important. And uh, just noting that there's there's still a lot of work to work to figure out um, how we move forward in these areas around these, um, especially around the waterways, especially the falls of the news. And uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Any further comments? All right, we've had a motion by council member Middleton and the second by council member Freelon that we adopt an ordinance annexing the Leesville Road assemblage into the city. Madam Clerk, will you please call the vote? Mayor Shule. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Aye. Council Member Caballero. Aye. Council Member Freelon. Aye. Council Member Freeman. Nay. Council Member Middleton. I vote aye. Council Member Reese. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, the motion passes six to one. We'll now move to motion two to adopt a consistency statement. Move to adopt consistency. Second. Moved by Council Member Middleton, seconded by Council Member Caballero to adopt a consistency statement. Would you call the roll, please, Madam Clerk? Mayor Shule. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Aye. Council Member Caballero. Aye. Council Member Freelon. Aye. Council Member Freeman. Aye. Councilmember Middleton. I vote aye. Councilmember Reese. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The motion passes six to one. I will now move to motion three to adopt an ordinance amending the UDO. Move to amend the UDO. Second. Moved by Councilmember Middleton, seconded by Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Would you call the roll? Mayor Shule. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Caballero. Aye. Councilmember Freelon? Aye. Councilmember Freeman? Aye. Councilmember Middleton? 
A vote aye. Council Member Reese. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The motion passes six to one. Uh, Ms. Smith, thank you, and thank you, Mr. Sivers. Uh, we appreciate you all being here tonight. Thank you very much, sir. We'll now move to item 29, and also public hearing item, the Consolidated Annexation for National, National Heritage Academies, NHA Oak Grove Charter. Uh, and um, we will first hear the report from staff. Thank you, Mayor Shul, Mayor Pro Tem Johnson, honorable council members. Good evening, I'm Alexander Kale with the planning department. I'm happy to be here with you. Uh, the applicant has requested a continuance of this consolidated annexation item to the November 2nd city council meeting. The agent Nilgosh is available to discuss the reason for this requested continuance on behalf of the applicant. Thank you, Mr. Kale. Did you say that the applicant would like to give us the reasons Yes, sir. Uh, no Gosh is on the. No Gosh is here. Sure. Thank you very much, Mr. Cahill. Mr. Gosh, uh, Madam Clerk, can you make Mr. Gosh available to be heard? I believe I am available now. Hi, Mr. Gosh. Welcome. Uh, and uh, please let us know. Um, uh, we'd love to hear from you on this. Sure. And good evening, all. This is No Gosh at the Morning Star Law Group. As staff indicated, we are requesting a continuance of this item until the council. November 2nd meeting, uh, primarily so that we can work with staff to make some adjustments to the UEA for this project. I know you all have a long agenda, uh, so unless there's any questions for me, I can leave it at that. I'm just requesting this time to be continued until your November 2nd meeting. And thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gosh. I appreciate that. So we won't open this public hearing. Uh, Mr. Cahill, we will uh, wait for staff to bring this back to us on November the 2nd. Thank you, Marshall. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Gosh. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Shule? Yes, yes. Hi, sorry to, 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 to um, jump in. We actually do have to open the, the hearing and continue it until that date, um, if you don't mind. It's I'm glad some... somebody smarter than me is here. Thank well, you, Ms. Smith. You. I appreciate um, <laughs> I'm gonna declare this public hearing open. And we will be continuing this public hearing until November the 2nd. Did I, did I hit it that time, Ms. Smith? You're good. Yes, you did. Sorry. Yes, you did. Uh huh. Thank you. All right. We'll now move to item 30, consolidated item, Chin Page Road. And uh, we will first hear the report from staff. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. I'm Danny Coulter with the Planning Department. A uh, request for a zoning map change for three parcels of land located at 5203, 5321, and 5421 Chin Page Road have been received from Jessica Harsby. The properties are currently zoned Industrial Light with a development plan, ILD, and the applicant proposes to change the zoning to the Office in Institutional, OI. There is no development plan associated with this request. The site is des designated Industrial on the future land use map. The applicant seeks, seeks a future land use map amendment to office, which would be consistent with the zoning request. Staff determines that these requests are consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. Three motions are required for this application. The first motion is to adopt a resolution amending the future land use map. The second motion is to adopt a consistency statement and the third for the zoning ordinance. Thank you. Staff is available for any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Kultra. Colleagues, you have heard the report from staff and I'm now gonna declare this public hearing open. And I'm first gonna ask if there are any questions for members, for, for the staff by members of the council. I have a question, Mr. Kultra. In the staff analysis, <clears throat> it says that the site is currently zoned industrial. The office is inconsistent with the surrounding properties, which include industrial to the west and low medium density residential to the north and west. There is no development plan associated with this application. Staff has expressed a concern that without a development plan, there is no way to address potential impacts or mitigating factors associated with development being adjacent to the industrial flum, 
which may include residential since it is permitted within the OI zoning district. However, staff recognizes that in general, the office designation does provide a more appropriate transition between the residential zoning and the adjacent industrial uses and less intensive list of uses compared to the industrial zone. So that was what was in the staff analysis. Um, do you, your, am I to understand that your concern with the lack of a development plan, uh, what, what, what made you, what made that concern not so important to you uh, that, that staff would recommend the approval of this uh, item? Um, I would actually like to get maybe Ms. Smith in on this as well. Uh, okay. Actually, uh, had gotten uh, this uh, case adopted to me uh, a little bit at the last minute. So, yeah. That's, uh, Danny, that's correct. Yeah. Danny's trying to help fill in. We have a lot of cases that um, we needed some help with for this meeting, but it's so um, the the staff um, the staff determines that the request is consistent with the comp plan and the unified development ordinance and the of course the future land use map we just wanted to point out the concern um, it's more of a concern that without the presence of a development plan there's no way to see the mitigation that may or may not happen through buffers and um, other graphic details you would see on a full-blown development plan we just wanted to throw that out there but it is a better transition the proposed district versus what is there now and that 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 overrode your concern about the lack of a development plan. It's it's kind of it's kind of a wash, honestly, um, because the uses that are allowed in the OI are less intense. So um, that's kind of where we landed, to be honest. But the planning commission did not have. They were not. I mean, they they were very supportive. They were. Not they were more supportive of the the OI being the uh, transition district versus the lack of the development plan. That's correct. Oh. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Uh, thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Culture or Ms. Smith before we hear from the applicant? Um, Mr. Councilmember Reese. Mr. Mayor, I, I didn't have any questions. I just wanted to um, remind folks who are listening who might have been uh, had that same concern. Uh, I often find it helpful to review the Planning Commission written comments, and I thought Commissioner Miller really addressed very well um, the how the OI how this change. Uh, is is good for this area going all the way back to the creation of the comprehensive plan in 2006 um, what the kind of the received wisdom was about how this part of Durham would be developed and the fact that it just hasn't worked out that way um, and so I found those those comments to be very helpful in helping me understand that part thank you mr. mayor thank you very much council member all right I think we will now hear from uh, the folks who have spoke signed up to speak on this item we have five people who have spoken up to speak, I'm sorry, who have signed up to speak. All of them are listing themselves as proponents. And the first one uh, is Jesse Hardesty. Uh, Ms. Hardesty, um, Madam Clerk, can you make Ms. Hardesty available to be heard? Good evening, everyone. This is Jesse Hardesty from McAdams. Um, I actually believe that Patrick Biker will be representing my case tonight, um, if he is available. On that. All right, thank you. Uh, we'll hear from Mr. Biker then. Thank you, Ms. Hardesty. Is Mr. Biker available to be heard? Mr. Mayor, I don't see Mr. Biker here this evening. Um, maybe Mr. Ghosh. Mr. Ghosh has his hand raised. I bet you he's the one. Thank you, Mr. Ghosh. Are you are you the, are you the representing the applicant tonight? It it's Patrick here. Is this? Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> I have no idea how these things work. The way <laughs> this it's is way is above my we, pay grade. We see you as Mr. Ghosh, but we know your voice, and we believe that you are Mr. Indeed, Mr. Biker. He has much nicer hair than I have. I will say that. I, I have to agree with that. Um, okay. Um, Mr. Biker, I see five people have signed up. Are all of them planning to speak? I'm trying to figure out the time here, or are some of them here to answer questions? Um, Mayor Shule, I believe that I'll give, I would like to give just a two, two or three minute uh, overview of the project. Uh, and then 
Uh, Jessica Hardesty and Rob Griffin from uh, Tri Properties are here to answer questions. And then I believe we have a couple of our neighbors from uh, Creekside who uh, wish to speak. Uh, so I, I, I can't speak for them, but as far as uh, Mr. Griffin and Ms. Hardesty, uh, simply here to answer questions. All right. And then I believe Mr. Gallman said he does not want to speak, but also there's a Mr. Kevin Walls. Uh, and let's find out first before we go ahead if Mr. Walls would like to be heard tonight. Mr. Walls, um, let me see if, is Mr. Walls still here? Mr. Mayor, I think he departed. All right. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Okay, Mr. Biker, I believe that um, you're on and um, and then you can ask. Uh, yeah, and I believe that I believe the other people are just here to answer questions. So. Uh, Mr. Biker, uh, please go ahead and make your presentation. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Shule, Mayor Pro Tem Johnson, members of the City Council. I'm Patrick Biker with Morningstar Law Group. I live at 2614 Stewart Drive. I'm here tonight representing Tri Properties for this agenda item. Again, uh, with us tonight from Tri Properties uh, is Rob Griffin, the Associate Director of Development, and as, long, as well as our site designer, Jessica Hardesty of McAdams. It's been my privilege to work with Tri Properties on the Bethpage development for the past 14 years. Back around 2006, Tri Properties was our lead office and industrial developer for Bethpage, an assemblage of property that amounted to about 450 acres located in fairly close proximity to RTP and RDU Airport. You may recall, members of council, that we had an almost identical rezoning for about 24 acres of industrial light that the council approved unanimously, changing from IL with a development plan to OI, and that occurred back on November 18, 2019. Well, tonight is pretty much the exact same thing, except that the parcels for tonight's rezoning only amount to 8.83 acres. We think the OI zoning district is a better fit for the adjacent Creekside neighborhood, and it allows Tri Properties, one of our leading office developers in Durham, to continue marketing this site for office use. Next, what I would like to discuss briefly is our team's decision not to submit a development plan for this zoning map change to OI. 14 years ago, our team undertook a massive TIA for Beth Page, covering over 400 acres. The Beth Page TIA, as part of the development plan that the county commissioners approved, runs with the land as a part of the zoning. That TIA accounted for potentially high peak hour traffic generation from these 8.83 acres within the IL zoning district. Any use allowed under the OI zoning district contemplated in tonight's agenda item would be equal to or less than what we accounted for in the original TIA. In fact, the staff report states that the, the anticipated traffic generation will, will be reduced by over 2,600 trips per day. Also, since Tri Properties does not have an end user at this time, it's impossible to scope a traffic impact analysis. However, if an end user does come along and a TIA is required, it will be done in conjunction with the site plan. Please keep in mind Durham City ordinances, including but not limited to the UDO, place limits on this site in regards to noise, lighting, building height of no more than 50 feet, and a significant project boundary buffer under UDO section 9.4. I think it was due to all these reasons that the Planning Commission gave us a unanimous thumbs up on July 14, 2020. And now, um, if one of our neighbors from Creekside would like to share their comments, uh, we would certainly appreciate that. Uh, my understanding from Mr. Walls is that uh, uh, he did uh, canvass the neighborhood and did not find any opposition to this request. And in fact, it was widely supported. We'll be happy to answer any questions you have tonight, and we respectfully ask for your approval. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Biker. Um, I don't see Mr. Walls here, but thank you for that information. All right, uh, is there anyone else that would like to be heard on this item? If so, please let us know in the chat. All right, um, colleagues, uh, are there any questions or comments for staff or the applicant at this time? All right. Hearing none, I'm going to declare this public hearing closed and the matter is back before the council. Uh, this will require three motions for approval. Uh, the first is to adopt a resolution amending the future land use map. Move to adopt. 
Is there a second? Second. second. Moved by Council Member Milton, seconded by Council Member Freelon. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Mayor Shul. Aye. <coughs> Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Excuse me. Aye. Council Member Caballero. Aye. Con Council Member Freelon. Aye. Council Member Freeman. Councilmember Middleton. I, I vote aye. Councilmember Reese. Aye. Madam Clerk, I wasn't sure that Councilmember Freeman got to vote. Councilmember Freeman, did you vote? Yes. Okay, did you vote aye or nay? Aye. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, the, thank you Madam Clerk. The, the ayes have it. The motion passes unanimously. The second motion will be to adopt a consistency statement. So moved. Second. Second. Moved by Council by Mayor Pro Tem, seconded by Council Member Middleton that we adopt a consistency statement. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Mayor Shul. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Caballero. Aye. Councilmember Freelon. Aye. Councilmember Freeman. Aye. Councilmember Middleton. I vote aye. And Councilmember Reese. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The motion passes unanimously. The third motion we do adopt an ordinance amending the UDO. So moved. Second. Moved by Mayor Pro Tem Johnson, seconded by Council Member Middleton that we uh, adopt an ordinance amending the UDO. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Mayor Shul. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Aye. Council Member Caballero. Aye. Council Member Freelon. Aye. Council Member Freeman. Aye. Council Member Middleton. I vote aye. Council Member Reese. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The motion passes unanimously. Mr. Biker, thank you to you and your, you and your team. We appreciate uh, having you here tonight. Thank you so much. Appreciate y'all. Appreciate y'all tonight. Sure. And thank you, Mr. Coltra, for stepping in. All right. Uh, we'll now move to item 31, also a public hearing item. Z190045, 1310 West North 54. Um, and uh, we will first hear the report from staff. Um, good evening, Grace Smith again. I'm here presenting this case as well. I will be presenting Z190045, 1310 West North Carolina 54. The applicant is Dan Jewell. This site is 1.194 acre and located at 13 West in C54, hence the title. Uh, the applicant proposes to change the zoning from residential suburban 20 to office institutional with a text only development plan. This request does not include a graphic development plan. The proposed text commitment commitment would only limit uses to those identified in EDO section 5.25 J office. This site is located in the suburban development here in the Falls Jordan district B watershed protection overlay. The future land use map designation is currently office, which is consistent with the proposed zoning request. The text only development plan commits to offices only, which means that those uh, uses are, commi are commitments and specific to use. The proposal is consistent with the comprehensive plan policies, including those listed in this slide. Uh, I'm sorry, not this slide, but further details are provided in the staff report. Staff determines that this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. There are two motions required for this application. The first is to adopt the consistency statement, and the second is to adopt the zoning ordinance. Staff is available if you have any questions. Thank you, Ms. Smith. And uh, colleagues, you've heard the report from staff. I'm going to now declare this public hearing open. Uh, I do not see anyone who has signed up to speak on this item. I'm double checking my list. Yes, that's correct. Is there anyone uh, amongst the attendees who would like to be heard? Mr. Ghosh, are you here to speak on this item? Yes, I am. Thank you, Mr. Ghosh. We're glad to have you. Uh, please go ahead. And thank you. And good evening, Mayor Shul, Mayor Pro Tem Johnson, and members of the City Council. My name is Neil Ghosh. I'm an attorney with the Morningstar Law Group at 112 West Main Street, Durham. I'm representing the applicant for the proposed text-only development plan rezoning. And thank you, Ms. Smith, for your presentation. As she mentioned, at just over one acre, this is a relatively small parcel and rezoning request. It also is, at least in my mind, 
an ideal candidate for a text-only development plan, which is a relatively new tool in the UDL. Because of its size, there is not a lot that can be built here under any zoning category to begin with. Moreover, because there are not any streams, wetlands, or other environmentally sensitive features on the property, the development of the site will not have significant impact on the greater environment. Additionally, even at this stage, we have some clarity on access to the site. The site's only frontage is along Highway 54 in a median divided area. Therefore, the site's access will be right in and right out only. The text only development plan allows us to make commitments as to use. In this case, we have committed that the uses will be only allowed to the extent the UDO allows office uses in the OI district. Of course, the UDO fills in the gaps on the other requirements for new development on the property. For example, maximum height is limited to 50 feet and building coverage is limited to not more than 60% of the site. Just to give you an idea, our latest yield studies indicated that the site would be maxed out with a two-story building uh, two-story office building of about 12,000 square feet uh, and about 48 parking spaces. So because of the limitations of the property and the configuration of the intersection and the requested zoning, the text only development plan actually offers a high degree of certainty with respect to how this property can or will be developed. I also wanted to note that although this is not a commitment nor anything that should be taken into, into your consideration, we do have a prospective tenant for this project in fact, the business has been involved with the rezoning from the beginning. It is an outfit called Spec on the Job, which is something like a bookkeeping and staff agency for uh, blue collar jobs. I understand that any office user could end up here, whether initially or in the future, but I did think it was worth noting that this rezoning may potentially help a Durham business relocate into a bigger space while remaining in Durham. Aside from those practical reasons, the staff already mentioned, the proposed rezoning is consistent with the future land use map. This is one of those area, areas where the underlying zoning does not match up with the comprehensive plan. In fact, the city's long range plans call for office in this area, which is what we are asking for tonight. Finally, the project did receive an overwhelming recommendation for approval from the planning com uh, commission at its meeting in July. Um, I thank you for your time and I'm available to answer any questions you have about the project. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ghosh. Colleagues, you have heard the report from staff. I've opened the public hearing. You've now heard the uh, report, the uh, presentation from the applicant. Uh, there's no one else here to speak on this item. So now let me ask uh, colleagues if there are any questions or comments that you all have for staff or the applicant at this time. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. Uh, could our staff just kind of refresh my memory on the text only development plan um, option and like what that what is missing from that that would be in a in a development plan. Sure, I'll be glad to, Madam okay. Pro Tem. Um, the text only commits is is basically what it states is text only. They're making a text commitment on the um, on the in the ordinance of this particular zoning, whereas. Uh, a full development plan would have a graphic sheet, a third sheet where you would see the um, parking and building envelopes, um, project boundary buffers, um, potentially um, any kind of um, other, um, like at, in your access, like uh, Mr. Gosh referred to earlier, your, in your right on right only access point. You're just missing that third sheet with the graphic illustrations that you would normally see on a full development plan. And the text only commits just to the uses only. Got it. Thank you. So they're so they can't make commitments in a text only development plan. Like you can't you can't make the same commitments that you would in a full development plan. You can only make commitments as regards to the use. That is correct. It's okay. a use commitment only. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for asking that question. I, that was very helpful. Um, Councilmember Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I don't have any questions for staff or the applicant. I just wanted to mention that, <clears throat> excuse me, um, there was a big part of my life where I drove past this location every single day, uh, at least twice a day, uh, because my girls uh, started school at Hope Valley Preschool, uh, which is about a block and a half uh, towards Chapel Hill on 54. Um, and during that time, I stopped all, basically every week at the dry cleaners on the corner 
that's going to that's adjacent to this piece of property. Uh, I always wondered what in the world is happening with that little piece of property there, and now I know uh, they haven't known what to do with it either. So, but here they are. Uh, they figured it out. Uh, they're going to do this. Uh, I think it's fantastic. I did ha have some initial concerns about uh, access in and out because I know from personal experience uh, it's kind of a hassle, um, especially since they installed the concrete median. You may have heard uh, someone mention. Um, but they've addressed those concerns and I'll be happy to support the measure. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council Member. Any other comments or questions? Council Member Freeman. Yes, thank you. I appreciate um, Council Member Reese uh, bringing back the memories all flooding through. I also um, have dri driven to and from. That location is specific. So I know um, just to Mayor Pro Tem's comment, if there were uh, bordered um, residential or other um, folks around that that property, I probably would have a little bit more angst about supporting this, but I don't for this particular case uh, based on where it's located. So thank you very much. Thank you, council member. Colleagues, any more comments or questions? All right, uh, if not, I'm gonna declare this public hearing closed and the matter is back before the council. We'll need two motions to approve this, one to adopt a consistency statement so moved. Is there a second? Second. Yeah. Moved by Council Member Freeland, seconded by Mayor Pro Tem Johnson, that we approve the, that we adopt a consistency statement. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Mayor Shule. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Aye. Council Member Caballero. Aye. Council Member Freeland. Aye. Council Member Freeman. Aye. Council Member Middleton. I vote aye. Council Member Reese. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The motion passes unanimously. We'll now move to motion two to adopt an ordinance amending the UDO. So moved. Second. Moved by Mayor Pro Tem Johnson, seconded by Council Member Freelon. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Mayor Shul. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Aye. Council Member Caballero. Aye. Council Member Freelon. Aye. Council Member Freeman. Aye. Council Member Middleton. I vote aye. Council Member Reese. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The motion passes unanimously. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ghosh. We appreciate you being here. Thank we'll you. Now move, we'll now move to consolidated uh, uh, item 34, our uh, last public hearing item of the night. We do have one supplemental item. Uh, but this is consolidated annexation Sykes property. You will also remember colleagues that we're holding this public hearing open from a previous uh, meeting as well. Uh, and uh, now I'll ask uh, for the report from staff. Good evening, it's me again. <laughs> I'm getting to see a lot of me tonight. We're glad to see you, Ms. Smith. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad. Uh, I'm happy to be here. So um, yes, this case, uh, Grace Smith with the planning department, this case was continued from the September 21st meeting. It's a request for utility extension agreement, voluntary annexation and initial zoning map change from Jessica Hardesty of McAdams for two parcels located at 7008 and 7012 Leesville Road, totaling 40.36 acres. The annexation petition is, is for a contiguous, ex contiguous expansion of the corporate city limits. There is a conservation subdivision associated with this case uh, for 80 single family lots. You, we had, um, you should see that, I think it's attachment 16 for you. It was attachment 14 in our staff report. Um, this site is presently zoned rural residential and the staff recommends an exact translation of the zoning designation. The proposed annexation area is designated as low density residential and recreation open space on the comprehensive plan, which is consistent with the zoning request. If approved, this request will become effective December 31st, 2020. The motions on this item may have stated September 30th, but we've corrected it everywhere else throughout the item, except for maybe in the motion that was on, published on the agenda. We apologize for that mistake, but it, the effective date would be December 31st, 2020. City and county operational departments such as Solid Waste, Fire, Police, EMS have all reviewed the request and the potential impact of this annexation at full build out while it's not yet known, could result in some reduction of level of service provided by the police department. 
the public works and water management departments have determined that the existing city and water and sanitary sewer system have capacity for the proposed development. The budget and management services department determined that the proposed annexation will become revenue positive immediately following the annexation. Additional information uh, can be found in the staff report. There are three motions required for this application. The first is to adopt the ordinance annexing the property and to in entering into the utility extension agreement. And the second is to adopt the consistency statement while the third is to approve the zoning ordinance. And staff is available if you have questions. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Again, colleagues, this is a continuation of an existing public, of an open public hearing and you have now heard the report from staff. Uh, I see two people are signed up to speak on this item. Um, Erica Latham and Bob Zum Zumwalt. Um, and I see that they are both here. Um, Madam Clerk, it looks like Ms. Z Mr. Zumwalt's been made available to speak. Mr. Zumwalt, are you with us? I am, thank you. I'm really just here for questions, so I, I don't need to make a statement. Thank you so much, though. How about Ms. Latham? I'm here also. I don't know if someone can make Neil available, but I think he can speak for us, too. Sure, yes. Uh, Madam Clerk, can you make Mr. Ghosh available? I think... Can you guys hear me now? Yes, we can. Welcome. And good evening again. I'm still Neil Ghosh at the Morning Star Law Group at 112 West Main Street. You've also heard that Erica Latham of MI Homes and Bob Zimwalt from McAdams are also on the call. Um, so you all heard about this item at your September 21st meeting, but asked to delay the vote on this item in anticipation of staff's presentation to you all about the Searles area at the work session on the 24th. So this is one of those projects in the Searles area that got delayed. I think we spoke at length about this project last time, so I will try to be brief, but I did want to reiterate a few things. Without a development plan, we're unable to make certain commitments, but if you've been out to the Andrews Chapel neighborhood, you should have a sense of what kind of homes are, uh, will be built here. Uh, this request is meant to serve as the next phase of the existing Andrews Chapel neighborhood, which currently is being built by MI Homes which is the applicant for the annexation. I think it is important to note, as I did last time, that this acreage does have some environmental features on it, which is one of the reasons why a conservation subdivision makes sense on this property. There is no doubt that through a development plan rezoning, it would be possible to get more homes on this property. Unfortunately, doing so would require environmental impact that simply are not warranted. Uh, under the current approved conservation subdivision plan for this property, there are about 20 acres shown for preservation, and of those 20 acres, nine are not impacted by any environmental features. So those are areas that could be developed, but doing so would require additional impact to the environmental features. For example, the current plan shows no stream crossing, uh, but at least one or probably two would be required to put homes on those areas. Sacrificing the environment for only a handful more homes simply does not make sense. Uh, finally, I want to touch on one of the lessons from staff's Searles presentation last month. Uh, developers do not look for pieces of land that are encumbered by a number of environmental features. In an ideal world, we would be looking at a flat, rectilinear, unencumbered piece of land and would be asking for tons of density. The reality is that the Searles area contains challenging topography, environmentally sensitive areas, and constrained infrastructure. As staff mentioned, there are certain areas throughout Searles where a conservation subdivision is the most sensible way to provide new housing without compromising the environment. That exactly is what we are attempting to do here. I'm happy to answer any questions you have about the project. Obviously, we hope to have your support tonight, and I hope you found staff Searles' presentation as illuminating as I did. I think that really helps put this project into context. Uh, thank you, and again, we've got Bob Zumwalt from McAdams, and Erica Latham from MI Homes available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Gosh. Uh, there is no one else to be heard on this item, colleagues. Uh, and so now I'm gonna ask if there are any questions or comments for either staff or the applicant by members of the council. I don't hear any. And so I'm now going to declare this public hearing closed. The matter is back before the council. Um, colleagues, it will take three motions to approve this. 
The first motion we do an, adopt an ordinance annexing the Sykes property into the city of Durham. Move to adopt the ordinance. Second. It was moved by Councilmember Milton and I'm not sure who seconded it. Could I have another second? It's Councilmember Caballero. Thank you. And seconded by Councilmember Caballero to adopt an ordinance annexing the Sykes property. Madam Clerk, can you call the roll, please? Mayor Shul. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Caballero. Aye. Councilmember Freelon. Aye. Councilmember Freeman. Aye. Councilmember Middleton. I vote aye. Councilmember Reese. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The motion passes unanimously. We'll now move to adopt a consistency statement. Is there a motion to adopt a consistency statement? Move to adopt consistency. Second. Moved by Councilmember Milton, seconded by Councilmember Freelon. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Mayor Shul. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Caballero. Aye. Councilmember Freelon. Aye. Councilmember Freeman. Aye. Councilmember Milton. Oh. oh, excuse me. I vote aye. Councilmember Reese. <laughs> aye. Uh, the ayes have it. The motion passes unanimously. Madam Clerk, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, now, colleagues, we need a, a motion to adopt the ordinance amending the UDO. Is there such a motion? Move to okay. adopt the ordinance to amend the UDO. That would yes. <laughs> Moved by Councilmember Middleton, seconded by Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Mayor Shul. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Caballero. Aye. Councilmember Freelon. Aye. Councilmember Freeman. Aye. Councilmember Middleton. I vote aye. Councilmember Reese. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The motion passes seven to zero. Uh, Mr. Ghosh, Ms. Latham, and Mr. Zumwalt, thank you for being with us tonight and for hanging with us so long. We appreciate you. Thank you. Have a good night. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Colleague, we now have one supplemental item that is not a, uh, a um, public hearing item. We took it up at the um, work session on last Thursday. Uh, this is the resolution in support of federal action to increase racial equity. I'm gonna ask Mayor Pro Tem Johnson if she wants to just say a word about this before we uh, take it up. Sure, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this is a resolution responding to several of the recommendations by the Race Equity Task Force which concerns areas of policy that are either um, outside of our legal scope or our um, financial size in order to, uh, to be able to implement. There was one change that was requested by Council Member Freeman at our work session that I made to um, the fourth point in the resolution about a $15 an hour minimum wage, recognizing that that is already quickly becoming outdated and really less than a family needs to survive. Um, so I changed that to $15 an hour or more with a um, with the with regular increases to account for inflation and, and increases in cost of living in order to more accurately reflect the uh, the demand that you know the that the minimum wage be something a family sustaining wage something that people could actually afford to um, to meet their needs and everything else is the same as before. Thank you for that, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Council Member Freeman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I appreciate Mayor Pro Tem's uh, making the adjustment. I just wanted to track back to the previous case. I ex expected you to close the hearing and then ask for comments. And um, I think we missed that. But I just wanted to note that in that previous case, acknowledging that it's a much smaller swath of land and that there were a number of commitments that were made uh, on that conservation district, I felt like that was a much better deal or much better plan than the previous um, plan that I did not support. So that was all. And then I, I just want to um, note if you're ready for motion, I'm ready. Thank you. I apologize, council member. I certainly would have been happy to have had those remarks, but I see Mr. Ghosh is still here and was able to hear them. So thank you. Um, council member Reese. Mr. Mayor, I agree with what council member Freeman said about the last case and I'll second her motion. <laughs> all righty. Uh, Council Member Freeman, let, let's uh, go ahead. Council Member Freeman, would you like to make a, a motion that we uh, approve this resolution? I'd like to make a motion that we approve the resolution in support of the federal action to increase race equity. And that's I'd like to second that motion, Mr. Mayor. Seconded by Council Member Reese. 
Any other Such comments? Councilmember yes, Middleton. Mr. Mayor, yes, sir. I, I don't know if we had a, a, a full reading of it at the work session, but if, if the Madam Mayor Pro Tem wouldn't mind, I think it'd be appropriate for a, a reading for the record's sake of it. I think it's an important document. Thank sure. you. Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Absolutely. Let me just pull that up. Resolution in support of federal action to increase racial equity. Whereas racial disparities in the U.S. are wide ranging and pervasive, negatively impacting the lives of millions of black people, indigenous people, and other people of color in myriad ways. And whereas the city of Durham affirms the dignity and humanity of each of our residents and the right of every resident to be free from discrimination and harm due to their race. And whereas the city of Durham is committed to the work to eliminate racial bias and racial disparity and create a more just and equitable world. And whereas over, after over a year of careful deliberation, the city of Durham's race equity task force has provided recommendations to the city council to increase racial equity, including several recommendations specifically intended to reduce the racial wealth gap and increase access to living wage jobs for black people, indigenous people, and other people of color in the US. And whereas several of these recommendations concern areas of policy outside of the legal authority or financial capacity of the city of Durham and must be enacted by the United States federal government. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Durham City Council calls upon our federal representatives to work toward the immediate enactment of the following policies. One, a program to provide reparations to the descendants of enslaved Africans sufficient to eliminate the racial wealth gap. Two, a program to provide a universal basic income to all citizens sufficient to meet each person's basic needs. Three, a program to provide a guaranteed federal or federally funded living wage job to all citizens. Four, an increase in the federal minimum wage to $15 an hour or higher with regular increase to account for increases in cost of living and inflation. Be it further resolved that the city of Durham commits itself fully to all necessary advocacy to ensure that these policies are implemented. Be it further resolved that the city of Durham requests that the city clerks and copies of this resolution to representative GK Butterfield, representative David Price, Senator Tom Tillis and Senator Richard Burr. This is the fifth day of October, 2020. Thank you very much, Madam thank Mayor Pro Tem. And thank, thank you for you the everyone. suggestion of the reading. Yes, thank you everyone for your support. Colleagues, we now uh, need to take a vote on this uh, item. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Mayor Shule. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Caballero. Aye. Councilmember Freelon. Aye. Councilmember Freeman. Aye. Councilmember Middleton. I vote aye. Councilmember Reese. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The motion passes unanimously. Colleagues, uh, we've had a good night of work. Um, I um, am we're working through these public hearings that we had to put off so long when COVID got going. And I think uh, tonight was a very productive night. I wanna thank the staff. I wanna thank our clerk and our deputy clerk. Uh, I really appreciate you all. I know this is hard and you do a great job. And to all of our staff, uh, city manager Page and everyone uh, on our staff tonight, thank you. I'm now going to declare this meeting adjourned at 9.52 p.m. Colleagues, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good evening. Bye. Wave. It's Zoom. Wave. Bye-bye. All right. See y'all later.